The following is a production of Cary TV, the town of Cary's government access channel. call to order the December 12th meeting of the Cary Town Council. And at this time, I would like to recognize Council Member Ken George for our ceremonial opening. Mr. George. To honor our country, let's all stand and do Pledge of Allegiance to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First order of business is to adopt the agenda. There's been one change to tonight's agenda. The resolution for the Ivy Ellington House has been added under reports. So is there a motion to adopt the amended agenda? So moved. There's a motion. Second. And a second. Discussion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. We have several distinguished guests this evening. I. My clerk has done an outstanding job of trying to get everybody mm -hmm. on this list, but we're going to miss a few. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to name the ones that we know of. And uh, I'll start with uh, North Carolina Senator Wally Nickel is here. <laughs> From the North Carolina House, we have Allison Dell, Julie Von Hafen, Sydney Batch, Gail Adcock, and Cynthia Ball. From the town of Morrisville, we have Mayor T.J. Colley and Councilmember Steve Rao. And from the town of Apex, we have Councilmember Audra Killingworth. And for those I missed, would you please stand so that we could record? Oh, I even talked to you. I'm <laughs> Oh. Matt Calabria here. Yeah, Thank you all so much for being here. This is a big night for us, and we very much appreciate you being here. Uh, at this time, I would like to recognize Council Member Ken George for some parting remarks. Mr. George. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Serving with the six of the most dedicated public servants the state has, in fact, maybe the nation, uh, as of today, having over 97 years of uh, town council service to carry between the seven of us, between Jack and Jennifer, that's over half of that's 50. So. <laughs> Jennifer started when she was 12. <laughs> yes, yes. So did I. <laughs> <laughs> Please continue. Yes. You know, this, this service for me to carry over these last uh, four years tops probably in the top five honors of my life to serve. Um, but first, to have served um, as an elder in the church. Second, to have served as a full-time missionary in the Dominican Republic, working with Haitians in some of the most impoverished neighborhoods in this hemisphere. Third, to have been a missions minister at the Point Church, leading teams to the Dominican Republic and to West Africa in Burkina Faso. Fourth, maybe to have marched in the Cary High School Band, representing Cary from the Rose Bowl to the Orange Bowl to the Cotton Bowl, the Kentucky Derby, and even representing all of the United States 
in the Fete de Genève in Geneva, Switzerland, spending two weeks there with then Mayor Fred Bond and Bam Booster President Coca Booth. This ranks up there with them. And I now to have had the four year opportunity to represent District D and work on behalf of Cary uh, to keep it, uh, Cary at the top of the best places in the world to live has been a real honor. I won't dwell on the one vote I regret, but we'll mention the unanimous vote I'm proudest of, which I shared with my six colleagues up here, the vote in closed session to offer Sean Stiegel the job of town manager back in 2016. Sean has truly helped us home in on what it's going to take to move forward to keeping us on top of our A-game. The staff knows the changes that have taken place, but the public just doesn't realize how his leadership has made such a difference in Kerry's future. And the way he works for seven bosses is unbelievable. Imagine going to work every day for seven bosses. I have some comments from my peers, um, I guess in order from the other end of the table. Ed, who I've known from working with Sister Cities long before he became a council member, uh, our thoughtful discussions on issues in the last four years have brought many times uh, us to the same conclusions. But if not, we both had an appreciation to each other's points of view um, on issues that we may have voted differently on. And those were few and far between, however. We do still feel differently about gumball trees. Uh, <laughs> but, but thanks, Ed, for your time. Lori, early on in the time of the council, we connected for coffee when I made a blunder on getting something on the agenda, an innocent mistake from misunderstanding. But she was so helpful in understanding that she helped guide me to a good resolution, even openly in discussion, taking my point of view in, uh, in her unsolicited comments. Lori's smile, uh, unlike Ed's smirk, uh, when I looked that way, <laughs> has been a constant encouragement to me. Um, my most embarrassing meeting, uh, which was um, quasi-judicial, when I voted three different ways on the same issue the same <laughs> night. And it happened, we have to place blame on me first, but happened after Laurie said after the first vote, well, I know I'm gonna, not going to change anyone's mind, but she went on to change my mind. So we voted a second time, and because I changed my vote, I had to make a motion for us to vote the third time so I could vote like I should have done in the beginning. So, Lori, thank you for your smile, your enthusiasm, your energy, and uh, that nonstop display of that. Don, we go back to high, Cary High School sports days with our kids on the field together. 14 years of announcing Cary High football games and seeing you in the stands, uh, plus all the times you helped me with my cars. Uh, even, even the shade tree mechanic I have, I am, you, you helped me so I could fix it myself. Um, and unlike some people, not charging me extra when I'd worked on them first. <laughs> um, as far as you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then there's the times you've taken to discuss in, in advance of meetings with me that I could bounce my feelings off of you, get, get a, a feedback. It's truly helped me prepare better for the meetings. And you've been a champion for downtown that's impacted me. In the debate for the 2015 elections, I'm not sure folks believe my answer about how many nights a week I spent in downtown Cary. I think I said three that night, but over the past four years, it turned that number turns out to be a little bit low. I uh, thanks in large part to your championing what Cary needed downtown and keeping it alive after five. Um, Don, I really appreciate all, the, all that you've helped me through. I appreciate it. Mayor, we've been acquainted for quite a while through your participation in our sister cities programs through the years, but working beside you on the council, I've come to appreciate that you were the right man at the right time. When I look at national politics, state politics, county politics, and even other municipality, <coughs> municipal politics around us, I can see that your steady, calm work to allow us to express our thoughts and for you to recap them without judgment and then to share your well thought position has kept the, the heat in the chambers down. Uh, we don't have those heated debates. We have civil discourse. It's a great example, and I think you've led the way, and I appreciate that. Thanks for being the right man at the right time, and then adjusting as the times have changed to still be the quiet voice of reason. Your encouragement through my election loss has been amazing, knowing that you also lost after one term as well. Um, I really appreciate and value your friendship. Skipping Jack um, for a minute. Jen, what a joy it's been to serve with you. 
to see all the regional impact that you've had in a positive way for Cary. Your energy is evident, your impact tremendous. Even when you've missed an occasional meeting, sometimes someone here channels your arguments. Don did it last meeting, I don't know if you watched it. It's infectious the way you want all of our citizens to have a sense of place where they live. But Don said, since Jennifer's not here, let me state Jennifer's position. So you were, you were well represented. Being concerned for Kerry's future comes through in all your arguments, whether because we made a mistake in the past that you don't want to repeat, or whether by making an argument that, that we may never have thought of and so as to avoid regret. But I appreciate your example. Back to Jack. So between the 50 years on the council that Jen and uh, Jack have together, Jack had 30 of them, um, we've known each other the entire time. When longevity is discussed here at the table or in, in public, he brings up the fact that when I served as chair of the Sister Cities Commission appointed by the council led by Mayor Coca Booth, that I had been on that commission for a year before they introduced the new liaison, the new guy on the block, Jack Smith, who had just been newly elected. That was early in 1990 when we met, and we're still working together on that same effort with the Sister Cities Association. Jack has forgotten more than I will ever know about zoning cases and decisions on the council, but that's not a commentary on his memory. He also remembers more than I'll ever know. He'll say, it seems to me like we decided back in 1994, and, and then he goes on to, to express, and he's usually right. But he's been a friend for these past 30 years of his service. We've been to numerous events together, hosted dignitaries, made toasts together uh, at home and abroad. But Jack, unfortunately, you'll still have to put up with me serving on that board with the Cary Sister Cities. I truly thank you for being a friend over half my life, which is really long considering as old as I am. Now to close, I don't have any wisdom of my own to share. I can't leave you all with any advice because even those that have served the shortest time have served twice as long as I have, up to nearly eight times longer with Jack. But I'll close with some wisdom from the, the wisest man ever to live on the earth, King Solomon. By the way, I have an ancient ancestor of Solomon George who lived in Wake County, was married in 1787, who's not buried too far from here. Um, but from Ecclesiastes chapter seven, a good reputation is more than costly perfume. And the day you die is better than the day you were born. Better to spend your time at funerals than at parties. After all, everyone dies. So the living should take this to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for sadness has a refining influence on us. A wise person thinks a lot about death, while a fool thinks only about having a good time. I never had any understanding uh, very good about that first verse, not the second half, the second half of it. The first part of it is pretty clear. A good reputation is more than costly perfume, and I believe that. The second half, the day you die is better than the day you were born. That always seemed morbid to me. But recently in a sermon, I heard a preacher comment on that verse, and some things make more sense to me. Four years ago, I sat out there about to be sworn in, and it was as exciting, just as a baby on arrival is so exciting to all those family members, even to the nurses and doctors. Uh, I know about babies, we just had our 16th grandchild last week and we're about to have number 17 next week. So I know the excitement of babies, but there's an unknown, a wondering, how will they turn out? What will they become? But then attend a funeral, like the two recent funerals of Marilyn and David Martin. There was certainty, life's well lived, of examples of lives with exclamation points at the end, no regrets. The birth announcement of a baby has some stats and a name while an obituary. Now there's a measure of life. So now as I sit here about to leave this seat, I'm so humbled by those who put me trust in me and I know I've not let them down. I've strived to do the best I could do for the town that I love so dearly, that helped me raise our six kids, the town that instilled in me through attending Cary Elementary through Cary High School about what it means to have a good reputation. It, it's better than costly perfume. And I again have to thank my wife who said to me after about a year on the council, you've got another love in your life. Her name is Carrie. <laughs> thank you for letting me have this four year affair to make a difference. 
to make a mark and help pave the way to an even brighter future by working for these last four years with these six amazing colleagues. If you see her in a store around town, thank her for sharing, her, sharing me with you. She's more than the wind beneath my wings. 41 years of marriage, she keeps me going. Thank you all so much. I'm saving my hug, Ken. <laughs> I tell you what, I've been involved in town government 22 years, not as an elected official, but just been involved. I can't remember anyone who's been as much involved as you have for your constituents. And as a matter of fact, I remember early on, we kind of tried to tell you to take it easy, slow down a little bit, right, Sean? We did, yeah. <laughs> it's like, kind of like overdoing it. <laughs> but uh, the last four years, we've really come to know you and uh, really got to know what makes you tick and what makes you tick is you bleed green. You love this town and you love everything about it with the, with the green. <laughs> you put your heart and soul in everything that you've done and that's all you can ask of someone that's elected. Put everything they got into it and you've done that. And as you mentioned Karen, I'm looking for Karen. There she is. <laughs> Thank you for sharing, Ken. That's a great sacrifice. Having been an elected official for many, many years, I know the sacrifice you and your children and the gazillion grandchildren you have that seem to, you seem to be having one like every week. <laughs> but uh, I'm hoping that this time will be great for you, that you can spend that time with Karen and your grandchildren and enjoy life and enjoy a deserved break because you've done an outstanding service to this town by spending your time. And lastly, thanks for being a friend. I didn't know you that well in the beginning, but getting to know you, I really enjoyed it. So thank you, Ken. You're welcome. Thank you. And anyone else before we go? Oh, please. Oh, yeah. Can we go first? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll just say really briefly, I just want you to know that Carrie's a better place because of the four years you spent here. And you, um, many people may not know, but Ken is a very creative thinker. He thinks out of the box, and he brought a lot of new ideas and fresh perspective and great, great ways for us to be thinking that we're different. So I really appreciate that. And, and I just think that your investment here has really been a great service to the town of Cary. Thank you. Thank you Jack? Well, while you were talking, I was reflecting on uh, my time with Ken, and, and the word irony just kept coming up. You know, I don't know why, I just, so I looked it up. I do that with the phone here, with the machines. And uh, you know, when you, when you look at the definition of irony, it's the expression of one's meaning by using language that normally signifies the opposite, typically for emphatic effect. Now, I first met Ken, as he said, uh, back in the late 80s when I got on the council. And as the newbie, uh, I had to go meet everybody, and I had the uh, uh, the opportunity to meet uh, Ken. And what impressed me back then was uh, his enthusiasm uh, for this newly formed Sister Cities Commission. And if those of you that know about Sister Cities, it's people to people, and the whole foundation of it is basically around diversity and inclusiveness. And we had just uh, formed as a council our first sister city in France. And, and, you know, Ken was just so full of this energy about getting to learn about other people. And we actually talked about other potential sister cities, and we talked about not just being Eurocentric, but being broader. And our next sister city, because we had such a large Taiwanese community, ended up being a city, a Sinchu city in Taiwan. And you know, uh, when you think about it, all of this just kind of reflected what Ken was all about. Uh, you heard him say earlier in his comments, you know, he was born nearby, he bleeds Carrie, and he's just so involved, and he just felt like what Sister Cities did is it helped reflect that very fiber, that very, that very essence of Carrie that, has, uh, that we have all kept 
in our hearts as we've tried to manage up here. And so now, you know, we actually talked back then about when I got on, we just had our first two female council members. You know, and, and we talked about how we're finally getting, that was Melba Sparrow and Regina McLaurin, mm -hmm. and they got on just uh, the half term before me. And we talked about how we're beginning to reflect as a council what this is all about. And so there's the irony. So as we continue our journey and we say our goodbyes to you, we get back to a council that more and more will reflect our citizenry. That's right. And I think, um, you know, how you, um, how you handled that, how you've embraced that new person, and, and Yalu, we're looking forward to that. And as a friend, I wish you well. You know, it's corny when we say, you know, what is that? When one door closes, another one opens. But you have so much heart and so much energy. I know we're going to see you about. And I wish you the best of luck, my good friend, Ken. Thank you, Jack. <laughs> Somebody saying all your comments. A lot of what's needed to be said has already been said, so I don't want to repeat it. And I'd also like to get home before about 1 a.m. tonight. <laughs> um, <laughs> What I will say, Ken, is I think we've all seen this over the years. Some people run for office to be important, and some people run for office to do important things. You're definitely the latter. Um, and I think, as Jack said, that's because your heart is in the right place and you care so much about this community. Um, it's not about you. It's, it's about Carrie. And I think that's one thing that's made you special. And I think that's one thing that's made you effective. Um, I've enjoyed our time together on this council, getting to know you better as a person, getting to know you better as a friend. Um, and I would agree with Jack that I'm sure we'll see you around. So we wish you the best and look forward to seeing you and working with you on some initiative out there somehow, somewhere. So Great. best of luck to you, buddy. Thanks, Don. By the time it gets to Ed, there won't be much yeah. left to say. Um, you can say ditto. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I'm, I think what makes Carrie great are, is people like you, people who give up, up their time, their talents, uh, their energy, and their treasures. Because we know that time is a treasure when it comes to family. And that's what makes Carrie great, and your participation in this council, and even before you were on council, and I'm sure even after, um, is a truly indicative of all the Cary citizens. Um, you are the representation, if you will, of public servant. You're not. You're doing it when no one else is listening, is watching. And so, for that, we thank you, and we look forward to seeing you around thank you. downtown, probably. Yes, thank you, Lori. I'm going to miss you most right here at this council table because where we sit, <laughs> I'm always looking in this direction at the rest of the council, just as I'm doing now, and Ken is always looking in this direction. So needless to say, we've seen a lot of each other over the last few <laughs> <laughs> That's not a pretty sight, necessarily. <laughs> but a lot of those looks over the last four years have been what I would call knowing looks. I look at Ken, and Ken looks at me, and I think we know what each other's thinking quite a bit, and I'm often hoping that Ken is going to keep that as a thought instead of necessary. <laughs> <laughs> Which he usually does. Uh, but it real, that kind of communication, that sort of unwritten communication that we've had, means a lot. It takes, there's incidents of that not at this council table as well, but sitting here, there's a, there's a lot going on from one end to the other, whether people realize that or not. And I'm going to miss that. I'm going to thank you for your service here on the council and thank you in advance for your continued service to this town. May God bless. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Okay, now's the time for the oath, oaths of office. And um, I'm first. You're first. <laughs> You're going to call yourself to the podium? <laughs> so I'm going to call myself to the podium, uh, invite my wife and Representative Gail Adcock to the podium at this time.
It's a distinct honor for me to swear in Harold Weinbrecht for the, his uh, fourth term as mayor, having served with this man, having the good fortune to serve with this man for seven years. I know what uh, Kerry has in store for it in the next four years, and thank you so much, Harold, for asking thank you. me to do this. Absolutely. Harold Weinbrecht, do you solemnly swear that you will support and maintain the Constitution and laws of the United States and the Constitution and laws of North Carolina, not inconsistent therewith, and that you will faithfully discharge the duties of your office as mayor of the town of Cary, so help you God. I will. Thank you very much. Congratulations. <laughs> Now I get to watch the rest. Our second oath of office will be Don France, and we'll invite his family and uh, town clerk Jenny Johnson to the podium. And this is just a small portion of Don's family. <laughs> wanted to get out of here early, right? Don France, do you solemnly swear that you will support and maintain the Constitution and laws of the United States and the Constitution and laws of North Carolina, not inconsistent therewith, and that you will faithfully discharge the duties of your office as council member of the town of Cary, so help you God? I will. Congratulations. Thank you. You sure you got everybody done? <laughs> Very good. And entertaining. Our third <laughs> oath goes to at-large council member Laurie Bush, and I would invite once again Representative Adcock and Laurie's family to the podium. say that um, listening to all of you talk tonight made me miss you even more after my seven years with you. Thank you, Lori, for asking me to swear you in. Lori Bush, do you solemnly swear that you will support and maintain the Constitution and laws of the United States and the Constitution and laws of North Carolina not inconsistent therewith, and that you will faithfully discharge the duties of your office as town council member of the town of Cary, so help you God? I will. Congratulations. <laughs> and our last oath of office is to Council Member District D Representative Yalu. Tonight, Supreme Court Chief Justice Sherry Beasley will be swearing in council member elect Ya Lu and Cherry Beasley is the 29th chief justice I'm sorry 29th chief justice of North Carolina Supreme Court and the first African American woman to serve as chief justice on the state's highest court I'll invite Justice Beasley to meet Ya and her family at the podium
Mr. Mayor and members of the Town Council, it is truly my honor and pleasure to be here this evening to administer the oath of office to Dr. Yah Lu. I'd like to share with you, if I may, how I know Yah. Uh, Yah is a statistician lecturing fellow at Duke Law School. And last year, I earned my LLM or Master's in Judicial Studies from Duke Law School. And even though Yaw had her already earned her PhD, she was in school at North Carolina Central University School of Law, earning her law degree. And so um, she is amazing. So she's my professor. Um, when I was working on my <laughs> LLM, she was wonderfully instrumental in helping me uh, collect the empirical data for my thesis on judicial on, on juvenile Miranda and so uh, she is a woman who is committed and dedicated and to your very capable board um, will bring a sense of scholarship um, ingenuity uh, creativity um, I'm not sure that anybody works any harder she um, is not only um, a le senior lecturer at uh, Duke, but she has wonderful young people who she uh, keeps very actively engaged in community activities. And I know, do they both swim? They do. They both swim, that's what I thought. And they're always doing something. So she's also a wonderful mom. I think you will be pleased uh, to work with her and to serve with her. And I think you will be thrilled, as will she, uh, to bring a sense of collaboration um, and the same kind of dedication and commitment that is required to run a town like Cary. Um, my husband and I lived here in the early 90s. And as you all very well know, this is not the same town of Cary <laughs> where my husband and I lived. So I commend each of you for your sense of hard work and dedication for making Cary one of the best towns in this country. Yeah, are you now ready to receive the oath of office? Please place your left hand on the Bible and raise your right. Do you, Yah Lu, solemnly swear that you will support and maintain the Constitution and laws of the United States and the Constitution and laws of North Carolina, not inconsistent therewith, and that you will faithfully discharge the duties of your office as town council member of the town of Cary, so help you God. I will. Congratulations. Thank you. I know uh, Council Member Yalu would like to give remarks. We're going to do that after she's seated at the table. So at this time, we're going to take a very short recess and uh, reset the table, and we'll be back into business in just a few moments. <clears throat>
Quiet. Hey, hey. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get started in less than two minutes. If you would please take your seats. Count it down. All right. <laughs> Come on, that was funny. That was pretty funny. <laughs> that was pretty funny. Mayor, I'll, uh, I'll text seconds. you the picture. Five seconds. Five. Four. We'll reconvene a council meeting at this time. Ladies and gentlemen, please. Ladies and gentlemen, please. Thank you very much. We want to welcome... Miss Lou to our council. Thank you council. so much for being willing to serve on this council. We view ourselves as a family. Families fight, they disagree, but they always respect and love each other and that's how we act as a council. So we welcome you with open arms and we look forward to what you bring to the table. And I know you have some remarks to make. There are plenty of your guests here this evening, so please. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Hello everyone. I'm so excited to be here, and we are here tonight, and it's magical, and I really appreciate that you're taking the time to be here. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Council Member Ken George um, for your four years of services as a council member and several decades of community services as a community leader and a citizen. I appreciate that you lent a hand to help me to make the transition into my new role um, as our next uh, council member. Uh, thank you so much. I would also like to thank uh, all the council members and mayor um, for being wonderful mentors to me and you guys are amazing and embracing me as your colleague. I'm really excited <laughs> and look forward to the opportunity to work with you. I am so humbled and honored to be here tonight. When I landed at the airport in Atlanta, Georgia on Christmas Eve in 2003, I never thought this could be possible. America is truly the best country on earth, which <laughs> where <laughs> This is a country where there is no limit on what you can accomplish. I would like to thank two special persons, uh, Senator Wiley Nichol and Maria Saranya. Can you stand up, please? <laughs> thank you for believing in me and working so hard for my campaign, and I'm really grateful. Um, I would like to thank my campaign team uh, members, uh, Quinn Yang, Professor um, Zeng, Xinlan Li, Tony, Jordan, Bill, Kathy, and many, many others. You have made this victory to possible. We had several hundred donors who contributed to our campaign, and we had several hundred volunteers who helped uh, this victory and make this victory possible. There was never a national party takeover scheme here. It's volunteers like Quinn Yang who worked with me as a volunteer in many cultural events and youth forums, encouraged me to run for office. It's volunteers like Quinn Yang and her 11-year-old son, Jake, who canvassed, knocked on doors, and made phone calls to their neighbors that made our victory together. I would like to share a little story with you. Yesterday, I met a gentleman, David, and he said, oh, you are yellow, and uh, probably I think I voted for you. And I asked him, uh, was your door knocked on? And did you have any literature on your door? And he said, I don't remember that. And I said, I know for sure you did not vote for me because our volunteers knocked on every door in our universe. If you didn't have anything on your door or your door wasn't knocked on, and that means you don't live in my district <laughs> and you didn't vote for me. <laughs> <laughs> that just shows how hard our volunteers work. That just shows how much efforts we put into this campaign. 
um, I want you to take a special moment uh, to appreciate what we accomplished together. I would not lie, running in Kerry was not easy, especially running as a challenger. You know why? Because Kerry is great. It's the best place to live in the country. It's because of what the council does is so good and, and our citizen support will do, do. That makes running as a challenger is incredibly hard. And we were trying so hard to find something that, you know, Kerry wasn't doing a good job at, like, like to run as our campaign platform. That was not easy, let me tell you that. Um, with hard work and um, much, a lot of efforts, you made this victory to get possible. Our turnout rate in District D was 24%, one of the highest turnout rate in our state, probably the highest in our state. What does that mean? That means we have the most engaged citizens in Kerry. We are lucky to have so many advocates for historic preservation, our environment, trees, and Armstead Park in our town. I thank you for your advocacy. I want to let you know that I remember you and every conversation I had with you during the campaign. I remember your encouragement and my commitment to you. I know what you did not just vote for Yalu. You voted for what Yalu will do for you. I'm your representative and your voice. I appreciate your encouragement. And I would like to encourage you all to keep getting engaged. It is you who are building our town together and it will make town better. It is your input that will make the council make better decisions. Thank you for the opportunity to serve you. Let's get to work. <laughs> so the next thing we're going to do is start the business meeting. Now, I know some of you probably don't want to sit here through that, so I'm going to pause just for a few minutes so you can sneak out the door. If you don't want to sit through the business meeting, uh, because some of it may or may not be entertaining. <laughs> Looks like most of the people that wanted to leave have made their ways way out of the chamber, so we'll get started. The first order of business is or organizational part of our meeting, and the first thing to do is the election of Mayor Pro Tem. And at this time, I'll recognize Mayor Pro Tem Laurie Bush for comments or, and or a motion. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, so serving as the Mayor Pro Tem for the last two years has been a joy and a privilege and I really love the ability and the opportunity to get out and represent this amazing town as as Yah says a lot of people are pretty impressed with Carrie and to be able to be that cheerleader out and about was a was really a blessing um, the rules important um, for those of you who don't know the mayor pro tem uh, it's actually Latin it means uh, pro tem pure which basically means the mayor when the mayor's not around which is the joke actually that Ed started um, about four years ago where somebody would ask well what's mayor pro tem oh it's the mayor when the mayor's not around and I don't see him so I'm the mayor <laughs> <laughs> and I used that for the last two years to <laughs> great comedic response as well um, and I do believe that it's a it's a great role that should be shared amongst the council. Um, and because of that, I, I feel that other representatives uh, that have the time and the interest and inclination should have that opportunity. And so I would like to nominate Don France to be our next mayor pro tem. Um, as we all know, he's a fierce advocate and a cheerleader for Kerry, always has been, and I'm sure always will be. Um, not only has he served District B representative for more than a decade, I'd love to say it that way, more than a decade, but I truly believe that Don France will do an amazing job as our mayor, next mayor pro tem, and I look forward to seeing him represent us in this additional role. So there's a motion. Second. So, and a second, and a third. Discussion. <laughs> All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Don, congratulations. Thank you. you Mayor Pro Tem. Laurie, thank you for your service. You're welcome. The past and, uh, two years. With that comes this handy. <laughs> <laughs> to heck with this. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. All right. It's all yours. <laughs> Careful what you wish for. <laughs> Item number two under organization is the appointments to boards, commissions, committees, and other town of Cary official entities outside and outside organizations. All of the council has a copy of the appointments. No motion is needed. The list of my appointments is available through the clerk's office and on our website. And believe me, I'm doing you a favor because if I read them, it would take about 10 or 15 minutes. So uh, we'll consider that a done deal and move to the next item, which is the adoption of the 2020 meeting schedule. It's also attached to the agenda. Uh, any comments or is there a motion to adopt the 2020 meeting schedule? So moved. There's a motion second and the second discussion all in favor please say aye aye, aye. Any opposed motion carries unanimously and we have a schedule thanks Jenny for putting that together we now move to recognitions reports and presentations our first recognition is an important one and it's the presentation of employee of the year and manager Stiegel will introduce this item thank you mayor we'll go to the podium One, Jenny, this one. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Katie. So, what important carry tradition was established in 1989? Jack was elected. The Jack Smith era begins. <laughs> Jack's first election, and then the start of our employee recognition program. <laughs> so, on December 4th, we held our annual employee recognition luncheon. We used a new format this year, uh, tried some new things. Some things worked very well, some things need to be refined, but it was a day for our, our employees to celebrate their great work and to celebrate one of their own. At that time, nearly 200 employees were honored, some with over 30 years of service to our community. But our employees have chosen one very special employee of the year to represent them. And that is principal planner and presenter extraordinaire, <laughs> Katie Dry. It's a remarkable achievement given that Katie only joined us in 2016. Uh, so here's what I said about Katie in that, in that award. Simply in her way of being, Katie has an innate ability to bring out the best in people, to diffuse conflict, and to elicit the confidence of diverse groups. She's an incredible person an excellent technician, and an essential part of what we're working hard to accomplish and carry. I'm grateful for, having her for her having chosen us, and I'm thankful to all of her colleagues who contribute daily to her and to our success. Um, one note that is very, very common in carry is those who do the great work of leadership and are the most effective at it typically don't understand it or aren't fully aware of it. And I think Mayor Weinbrecht's probably the best example of that. Every time I tell him he did a great job, he's like, me, me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you. But that is, in fact, what powers him. And Katie's no different. Katie is extraordinary. She brings people together just by being Katie Dry, and that's a very, very powerful thing. Uh, now, Katie, I understand that you really don't want to say a few words tonight. And I said to the person who shared that with me, Carrie, I said, well, that's too bad. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We have, this, uh, we have this award for you here, Katie, for our 2019 Employee of the Year. It's nice and heavy. So. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, thank you Mayor. Um, it's an honor to work for the town of Cary, and it's an honor to um, work for a wonderful council that has set such a, a great vision for the town, and I have an honor of helping to implement that vision. And it's an honor to work for Sean as well, so thank you all. Thank you. I'll see you later tonight. All right. <laughs> Our second recognition report and presentation is the presentation of the fiscal year 2019 comprehensive annual financial report, referred to as CAFR. Uh, Chief Financial Officer Karen Mills will present this item, and Council may take action. Ms. Mills. Good evening, Mayor and Council. 
Tonight, we're here to officially present the CAFR. I'll begin briefly with some updates about the report content, touch on the town's financial results, and then transition to the audit process before I introduce our audit partner to provide her perspective on the process and the report and to make some required statements to you. The CAFR title begins with a description comprehensive because the report contains much more than the town's basic financial statements. For example, there are dozens of tables with long-term trends and details in a statistical section. For the second year, we included an expanded introductory section with an overview that highlights the town's financial results in terms that were designed to meet your needs in addition to the prescribed formal methodology set out by the Governmental Accounting Standards Board. We included description of how town finances are administered through special focus areas such as cash, debt, and budgetary management. <coughs> like our quarterly reports, but for the entire year, the overview includes a summary of the year's most important accomplishments with stories of how we invested <coughs> our citizens' dollars to meet council and the community's highest priorities. These stories are organized to demonstrate alignment with our goals in the Car Imagine Carry Community Plan. The CAFR provides financial summaries of our priorities by showing where we invested in the community. Operational expenditures townwide increased to $238 million. Just like in 2018, we increased our investments in technology that will streamline and enhance how we deliver citizen services that will help minimize cost increases in the future. We spent over $94 million on capital projects. And while we have approximately 400 active capital projects, we invested just one third of that 94 million on four initiatives of about $8 million each. The downtown parking deck, Carpenter Fire Station Road and the CSX rail grade separation, street improvements, and our raw water pipeline. The CAFR also shows how we paid for those investments, and debt is always a point of interest. This year, we debt financed $8.5 million to pay for some replacement ladder trucks and a part of the costs of Fire Station 9. Some of our capital projects were paid for with savings and fund balance. In all, we had planned to draw on our savings and fund balance for about $11 million. But because the general fund had a net positive result of $20 million, our fund balance actually increased $9 million. These are important reserves to pay for future capital needs. Part of that $20 million positive variance came from $7.5 million in revenues over budget. <coughs> Expenditures came in $10.3 million under budget. <coughs> and likewise, on the utility fund side, we had a positive outcome in operations. In this chart of revenues and expenditures, you can see the outcome of many years of planning that's generating operating income to fund capital maintenance of our important water and sewer infrastructure. The FY 2019 CAFR informs our future and shows us that we have the foundation to keep carry carry throughout collaborative budget management, long range planning for both operations and capital, and to manage the investments authorized by our citizens in the October bond referendum. We'll analyze strategic options for the town's financial future and we'll also maintain our quarterly focus to build our strength in financial analysis and staying on top of the details through our rolling budget process. As in the past, we continue to use our top bond ratings as a benchmark of excellence in financial management. As expected, the auditor's report provided what we know as a clean opinion, and the auditors did not issue a management letter. And that means that the town staff performed quality work in managing financial transactions throughout the year and in preparation of this report. I'm extremely proud of the work of all of our financial experts, but two employees stand out, Judy Denardis and Jessica murphy Rim. They deserve special recognition for their accomplishments to prepare this CAFR. So now I would like to introduce April Adams. She's our audit partner at Cherry Beckert, and she'll give her perspective about the audit process and their opinions on the financial statements, and she'll make some required statements to you. And after that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. So, good evening. I'm sorry, I've sat still and not spoken for so long. <clears throat> 
Um, I'm happy to be here to share the results of the 2019 financial statement audit. Um, as your auditors were required to conduct your audit in accordance with two sets of auditing standards, uh, the first is um, the generally accepted auditing standards of the United States, and the second set of standards is the government auditing standards. Those standards require that we plan and perform your audit to obtain reasonable assurance that your financial statements are free from material misstatement. What that means is that we perform a risk-based audit, that we use our professional judgment to um, assess where the risk of material misstatement exists um, in your financial statements, and that we simply just didn't test every sing single transaction that occurred throughout the year. We are required to express opinions as a result of our audit. For the town, we express four different opinions as a as a part of our audit. The first is the opinion on the financial statements themselves. The next opinion covers the internal control environment over the financial reporting with compliance in compliance with laws and regulations. And the last two opinions cover whether the town was in compliance with um, their administration of the federal and state grant um, monies that the town receives. I'm pleased to report that the town did receive um, unmodified opinions on all four of those opinions. Um, that is the highest level of assurance that we can give you that your financial statements are free from those material misstatements, um, as well as in compliance with the laws and regulations and the compliance requirements for those grant agreements. Um, the audit standards also require that we communicate certain things to you um, related to the audit, and we do that in two ways. One is a letter that accompanied the financial statements in your staff report, as well as this presentation itself. Um, the few things that I want to share that's in that letter I want to highlight for you tonight would be um, to confirm that we are independent of the town and we maintained our independence throughout the audit. Uh, the second would be that there were no significant changes in accounting policies throughout the year. Um, the letter also identifies what your significant estimates are in your financial statements. Those include um, your allowance for doubtful accounts, your depreciation on your capital assets, your pension and OPEB liabilities, um, as well as the claims related to being self-insured. There were no journal entries as a result of this audit. Um, what that means um, to you should be that the records and books um, that were given to us to audit are ended up what being what ended up what being reported in your financial statements, um, and that the financial statement has good po processes in place to capture and report all the data and transactions throughout the year. Um, and in closing, I would like to thank Karen and her team. Um, they are always ready when we're, when we're scheduled to come out to perform the audit. They do make us a priority um, while we're here, and so we appreciate that because it makes it an efficient process. Thank you very much, April. Mm -hmm. If there's any questions, we'll be happy to answer them. I would just say, once again, thank you for an excellent job. I'd love to hear a third party come in and say, hey, we got nothing wrong to say. You guys are doing perfect things. So. Thank you for, to you and your staff. Thank you very much. And having said that, I would be open to a council member making a motion. Um, make a motion that we accept the uh, FY 2019 CAFR. Second. Motion and a second. Discussion. Mr. Mayor, may Oh, please. I just want to, um, Karen and her team deserve uh, public praise so much. I, my nickname is, some of you know for Karen, when I first got here, I call her the unicorn. <laughs> because uh, financial wizards aren't supposed to be amazing at dealing with people too. You don't get it all I'm so jealous and she has. Um, so we call her the unicorn. And um, in Carrie, over the years, the people in this community, the council and the staff has become accustomed to excellence. Um, I've had the, the opportunity to work in several other communities and have a true appreciation of what it means to not have a single journal entry. Because, I mean, no accountant likes journal entries, but having a handful of those with all the transactions, it means they didn't have to adjust anything. Th that's extraordinary. And here it's like, oh, yeah, we don't, we don't have those. To not have a management, not a couple things to opine on from the auditors, that, that, I just still marvel at it. And then lastly, when Karen uh, presented me with the year-end numbers for the first time, I looked at them. And I just started giggling because how could things be this good? And giggling with appreciation not only for the finance team, for Karen, her entire staff, but for the department directors that continue and their staff continue to ask, uh, I know I ask a lot of them, and they do it with such uh, financial stewardship, such excellence that we don't need a lot of money to provide the best services to this community. And so um, 
let us never take for granted an audit that produces numbers like these in a manner like that, even though you can expect it every year in Cary. So thank you, Karen. Thank you, yeah, and thank I really you, appreciate you mentioning the other departments because without their cooperation and their financial stewardship, they take it all very seriously. We couldn't do it without them. So I'm very proud of the culture of financial management in this organization that extends from the top to the bottom. We appreciate your support, and it, it filters all the way down, and that culture makes a real difference. Thank you. So we have a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any oppose? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. We now move to our third item, which is recognition uh, is the resolution for the Ivy Ellington House. And once again, I'll recognize Mr. Stiegel. Um, I This item was uh, the result of after the agenda was published and um, the members of uh, the friends of the page walk were able to look at it who have um, uh, taken on the Ivy Ellington as something that's very special to them and through the assistance of the, the council liaison had asked us to place some additional language in the agreement um, that would uh, make the council's intentions which have always, which is all, all, have always been clear at least in three years I've been here to not only preserve but to continue to energize and promote the Ivy Ellington as a part of the downtown's future. And the first uh, reaction to that was we can most certainly do that because we've made that commitment. Not only have I as the town manager on behalf of the council, but every council member at this dais has been committed to that. Uh, the agreement uh, on that item is a multi-party agreement, so that wasn't um, in, in Chris Simpson's determination the most appropriate place to it, but to ask the council to resolve, to pass a resolution, making it clear for everyone to uh, see and feel the council's commitment, this community's commitment to the Ivy Ellington. So I'm, uh, I'm thankful to the council for your leadership on this. I'm thankful to the, the friends and everybody that was involved for coming together, working together in about 24 hours to craft this before this meeting went on. And again, it's, it's really something that you can only experience and carry people working together to meet each other's needs. And so uh, I think this uh, resolution reflects that. Thank you, Mr. Stiegel. I can tell you that this council is very, very reluctant to do any resolutions. And when they do resolutions, the words are very, very measured. And if you look up resolution in Merriam-Webster's dictionary, you'll see that it's an opinion, it's an intent, on, uh, and it's voted on by an official body. And so it is our opinion and it is our intent to preserve and protect the Ivy Ellington House. And by passing this, I'm assuming it will pass, we are making that statement for all to be known. Um, so having said that, I would open it up to the council for a motion. Make a motion to approve this resolution. Second. Motion and a second. Additional comments? Or? Yeah, I want to thank the staff and the Friends of the Page Walker for putting this together over the last 24 hours or so. It's really an amazing thing. Every word in the resolution speaks to exactly what it should be speaking to. So <clears throat> I, I applaud that. I, I just ask that as the development agreement process continues on, and with this project, somehow or another, I don't think it's going to come to fruition any time soon. It's still going to be, even the development agreement seems to indicate that it's a couple year process until things happen. Uh, I would love to have you exhaust every possibility to see whether it could be included as an exhibit to the agreement. Not the, in the agreement itself, but there are a number of exhibits if it could be added. If it can't, it can't. It's a wonderful <coughs> resolution the way it stands. I would love it if, if through your efforts, and we could see if it could be included as an exhibit. But thank you very much. Other comments? We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Stiegel. Thank you, Mayor. And thanks to all those who whipped that together in a short amount of time. We now move to our fifth item. It's public speaks out. We've, in inc we've included instructions for public <coughs> speaks out on the printed agenda. And if you would like to speak at Public Speaks Out, I would ask that you sit in the rows to my right that are shown as reserve and follow the instructions on the agenda. Public Speaks Out speakers have three minutes each for their comments, and speakers may speak on any topic as long as it's not a public hearing. And that works to your benefit since you get more time to speak at a public hearing. 
As I mentioned, there is a three minute time limit and once you reach three minutes, I will interrupt you immediately, not trying to be rude, but trying to be fair to our speakers, since there is a one hour time limit for Public Speaks Out. There's a timer on the podium. When there's three, when there is 30 minute, 30 seconds left, you will get a yellow light. And when those 30 seconds have expired, you'll have a flashing red light and that's the moment I will interrupt you, again, not trying to be rude, but trying to be fair to all of our speakers. Uh, to have an efficient public speaks out uh, item on the agenda, I would ask that if you're here with a group, to have a spokesperson for your group so that we don't have repetitive comments, and that would give more time to other speakers. Also, if you'd like to speak after the speaker that's currently speaking, I would ask that you stand right there on the stairs that the lady's standing at now. And that way we know that there are other speakers <coughs> and we, it will help us have a more efficient public speaks out. I thank everyone in the audience for understanding that this is a business meeting. Please do not applaud, make remarks from your seats or anything else that may distract from this meeting. So now's the time for Public Speaks Out, and I would invite our first speaker forward. Well, I'm very excited to hear about this resolution. My speak out has to do with that topic, so I'm very excited to read it since it was so quick. I haven't had a chance yet. So we have a public hearing coming up. It's not about, okay. it's not about completely about okay. that. So okay, why. very good. Okay. My name is Joy Bunch, and I'm a downtown resident. I've spoken out a couple times during the public speak out, and I thought tonight would be an appropriate time to do so again. Due to prior commitments, I was unavailable to speak out during the public hearing on the LDO changes, and with tonight's public hearing on the project development agreement affecting the Ivy Ellington House, I felt I need to say something. I want to first say thank you for the town staff and council for working on preservation efforts, for including money in the bond, and for hiring a preservation planner. The Cary Community Plan states the following policies for downtown Cary. Policy one, foster downtown's authentic character. The intent of this policy is to maintain the historic and authentic character of downtown Cary's built environment. The revitalization <clears throat> and redevelopment efforts should make it a priority to work within downtown Cary's existing and historic design <coughs> framework. This entails incorporating appropriate scale and massing of buildings. Policy five, encourage downtown reinvestment and redevelopment. The purpose of this policy is to support private action to improve, invest in, and redevelop properties in downtown. This policy should be considered in light of the town's existing preservation policies. The downtown policy one particular that adaptive reuse of historic structures is preferred over complete redevelopment. <coughs> downtown Cary is a unique from the rest of Cary. To treat our downtown the same as a destination center is a little concerning to me. Yes, I want my downtown to be a vibrant showcase destination. <coughs> But we can do that by maintaining our authentic character as stated in policy one and encourage adaptive reuse of <coughs> historic structures as stated in policy five. The current development activities occurring in downtown, downtown appear to contradict these policies. The town should put in place the formal preservation policies and programs listed in the town's adopted historic preservation master plan, which is also referenced in the community plan. Action 216 to develop alternative zoning and design standards for the town's historic core to ensure compatible infill development and to reinforce the traditional design patterns. Action 244, develop a process by which proposed changes to demolition or moving of historic significant town owned properties should be reviewed first by the Historic Preservation Commission. The town highlights that the community plan was shaped by the community, but the policies, especially those pertaining to historic structures, do not appear always to be a high priority for this council and staff as it relates to the current development activities occurring downtown. Please keep in mind that these policies reflect the voice of the community, and we have put our trust in you to act on our behalf. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. <coughs> Good evening. My name is Heather Durand, and I moved to Cary six years ago from Garner. Uh, also in line with the development of downtown, I would just like to speak about development and traffic. Um, I appreciate the work to increase the development of downtown. However, I feel that it's happening with an afterthought to the traffic and traffic patterns. Um, as an example, I emailed Rob Myers, the town traffic engineer, um, about a month ago about 
increasing near accidents at the stoplight of Kildare Farm and Walnut at the new library with that right turn lane, people going straight because they don't realize it's a right turn only. Um, I'm also concerned that the new development plan in um, item 7.1, that you want to add another 500 spot parking deck when we already have the large <coughs> parking deck for the library. All of the town roads in downtown Cary are two lane roads. It's already heavily uh, trafficked as it is. There's a lot of pedestrian foot traffic. Sadly, the town of Cary has already had several pedestrian tragedies, fatalities, injuries this year. And I'm just concerned about the epic increase that these large, you know, multifamily units, office buildings, how will we adapt the traffic areas to cover and protect our pedestrians? We have an elementary school, the Arts Council, several park areas, not to mention just the businesses and churches that are in the area. So how can we continue to maintain our level of development, but also keep in mind the traffic? Um, Rob Myers did <clears throat> respond to me. Um, he did mention that some of it is having to work in conjunction with the NCDOT. It's not just the town of Cary. However, um, <coughs> You know, he mentioned that there is a project in design process, but the library is already there. The traffic is already going to increase. And to me, if it's in design process, that means it's like at least a year out. Um, so I'm just really concerned, you know, especially, you know, with the injuries that have occur occurred to our citizens and fatalities, especially. And, you know, the downtown Cary Face Group um, has also posted several, like, near misses just on Academy Street. So how can we as a town work to maintain our development, but also, you know, have an eye for the traffic? Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Next speaker, please. <clears throat> Um, hi, my name is Amy McMahon. I want to thank you all again on such an um, important night as you're swearing in. Um, obviously, um, again, very appreciative of your investment and in all you do for the town of Cary. Um, and Ken, um, thank you for your outgoing service. As you jokingly said, you had an affair with being able to serve here. Um, I married into Cary. I was living in Durham 30 years, and I uh, married two and a half years ago. Um, and I've so appreciated getting to uh, experience these many things that make Cary such a great place to live including the beautiful greenway spaces that we have for running, for cycling, <clears throat> everything. Um, the reason I am up here, though, is that one of those resources is in jeopardy, and that is the Black Creek Greenway, one of the highest used one, um, with a lovely expanded parking deck area, uh, or parking area there, that is adjacent to Umstead State Park, including the area that is ill-defined, I'll be honest, and <laughs> the Odd Fellows tract. And you might have heard um, in the media, uh, you know, that the Wakestone Quarry Company was uh, recently leased in the spring, uh, the ability to expand the quarry into the Odd Fellows tract. Um, I am very concerned about the impact that this will have on all residents of Cary who experienced the blessing and beauty of this Greenway resource and the Bridal Trail, which is the East Coast Greenway that extends right from one side to the other. The Odd Fellows Tract is much closer than the existing quarry. The existing quarry is 400 feet down, it's deeper. There is still stone there to my understanding that can actively be continued using to generate stone. Um, once the surface level blasting starts happening, there will likely be fine particulate matter with each of the plumes. You can go online with any YouTube video and see the blasting. Um, it is reported by many people that even SAS feels <coughs> the building shaking. There are things that happen each and every blast. I am very concerned because I voted for the referendum for the expansion for the greenways and you, it, we need to be good stewards of our resources. 
And so what I am requesting um, in the limited time is that, as you said, resolutions are very important things. I am requesting a public written resolution opposing the Wake uh, Quarry expansion. I would like some uh, appointed people on council to actively engage in gathering accurate information and to be uh, decision uh, influencers. We may not be decision makers because we're not one of the four on the lease, but we can be decision influencers and I'm asking you to do that for the well-being of the whole community. This resource will be squandered. Thank you. Next speaker, please. <clears throat> Hi, Council. My name is Elizabeth Adams. I'll be speaking about the same issue. Um, I share her concerns. I want to talk a little bit about um, how I came to this position. I recently, I'm a mid-50s year old person. Uh, I live in Cary. But I have a 16-year-old daughter. She's an active swimmer, and I decided I need to get in better shape. <coughs> and so I chose cycling and started riding. And my choice was to ride down the Black Creek Greenway through Umstead State Park, past Sass and back home. And um, while I did that, I was also collecting air quality data. So I'm an air quality researcher at UNC. And I have a little, I didn't bring it tonight, I should have, PM 2.5 meter. It's basically a laser counter that counts particulate matter in the air. And so I've ridden 2,000 300 miles this year through Umstead State Park, and every day that I've been able to, I've taken that particular matter. And invariably, the dustiest place in Cary <coughs> is right at the entrance to Wake Stone. So when you have blasting occurring, and then you're taking that rock out of the quarry, it's going onto trucks, they do have wet suspension methods to kind of knock down the particulate matter if the trucks use the wash system at the entrance. But it's not very effective. And so if any of you go out to the entrance of Wakestone, you will see um, particulates, not PM 2.5, but larger particulates that are on uh, the road that goes over I-40. So one particular day that I rode was on Thanksgiving Day in the evening. The sun was setting. It was really bright and windy. So all that particulate matter that was on the ground was getting uh, resuspended and put into the air. And so I was breathing that. And I got home, and sure enough, I checked my meter, and it was 100 micrograms per meter cubed, which is too high. People should not be exposed to that. So I ask you, implore you, to do something to protect the citizens of the town of Cary. There are people like me who do this every day who are getting exposed to poor air quality. Um, this rock is also probably high in silica. So until we test the percentage of silica, it could also be causing silicosis, which is a, a disease of which you cannot, um, you, you can't be healed from. So I think it's really imperative that we as a town understand that an incompatible use, such as a quarry, should not be put next to our state park system. And that we as a town should do everything in our power to uh, influence the decision makers. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. <clears throat> Hello, Mayor, Town Council. My name is Maria Cervania. I live at 102 Dometh Court in Cary. I'm here as um, the president of the Berkeley HOA. I actually wanted to commend the traffic and transportation staff and department here in the town of Cary. I wanted to tell the second woman who spoke that there is hope. Our journey has been long. It's been four years since that first meeting we had with Mr. Jensen, Mr. Spencer, and officer, I believe now Captain Jenkins. We had a concern and there was a desire in our, in our neighborhood to have a light at High House and Sir Walker Lane. Uh, I knew practically that that could probably not be uh, a, a, an option for us. But we knew that we needed to have a solution. And the only way we can have a solution is actually to work together with the town and also with you all to, and the neighborhood 
with all the heads of the HOAs to bring some solutions together. I was impressed and happy to know that in 2016, you all proposed intersec an intersection project program, and it included a project to where it would add a light at Jenks Carpenter, but more so in, in effects for us, reopening the left turn lane of Weddington into Wellesley. And I'm so happy to say, uh, just a few weeks ago, we were able to meet with Mr. Nazarati and also Mr. Spencer and Mr. Byrne to have it told to us that it will be a priority in 2020. So I am very grateful to the staff. I'm grateful to the council that that will be a reality for us. It's not all our solutions, but it still needs to be expressed much thanks and to those who have traffic problems all over Cary, that there is hope and that the staff and council is attentive towards those concerns. So thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening. <clears throat> I'm Alan Ward. I'm a principal at Sasaki Associates, and we are a planning and landscape architectural firm working on the transformation of Cary Town Center. This is a, an extraordinary project, and, and what, a, what a great story it is, just to imagine taking a single-use retail center and making it a, a great place, which is far more interesting, varied, and complex. These projects are happening all over the country. I've worked on them for about 30 years, and this development team of Turnbridge and Denali they're aiming very high. The hope here is to make one of the best planned mixed-use centers in the country. It's a transformation of this kind of single-use site. And if you look at the characteristics of these other successful kind of mixed-use projects, at the heart of them is a great series of public open spaces. So at the heart of this plan, and what's part of the vision, are a series of plazas, uh, public parks, a great civic gathering space, and it's all connected by a network of streets, which has bicycle facilities built into it, off-street bicycle tracks, as well as other greenways. And when you look at this plan diagram, you're not really seeing all the future green spaces. It's very diagrammatic, but when each of these development parcels comes to fruition, you'll have plazas. Most of the housing will be built around green courtyards. The streets are designed to have great growing conditions to allow for mature street trees which will shade these sidewalks. So it's a complete transformation of a site which has a shopping mall with all this paving into a connected network of open spaces shaded by street trees, small green parks, plazas. The spaces will be designed to be programmed for use from small concerts to major civic gathering spaces. This will bring people back time and again for kind of varied experiences. Uh, the architecture is going to be uh, varied and interesting. There'll be a number of different architects. There'll be different height buildings. The plan is kind of relaxed a bit, so that gives variety, as if it kind of almost evolved over time. So if you look at all these elements, along with the tenanting of the, uh, of the, of the buildings, and this client knows tenanting, the retail will come to life at street level with outdoor dining to make the spaces come to life. So you add it together, the planning, the urban design, the landscape architecture, and the tenanting all are working together to help make this potentially be a great place in the region. So that concludes my remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, my name is Amos Clark. I'm with McAdams Company. Um, I serve as the director of our water resources department there and have uh, been with McAdams for 25 years. Um, the whole 25 years has been <coughs> focused in, on stormwater management and a lot of that for land development sites. Um, I apologize for my voice. It doesn't hurt as bad as it sounds like it does. <laughs> um, I'm also here tonight to talk about the redevelopment of the Cary Town Center site and really to compare the stormwater management plan that's being proposed for this site to the stormwater management plan that you would see for a typical development site. So in a typical site, uh, we typically we will have an increase in impervious surface and runoff from a site 
is directly correlated or directly proportional to the amount of that impervious surface that's on the site. Um, so we have an increase in runoff volume, you have an increase in runoff flow rates, and we do things to mitigate that. So we put engineered devices on the site to mitigate against that impact. And we target certain design storms. So you probably heard uh, pre and post development for the two year storm or pre and post development for the 10 year storm, which means we are matching that flow rate that occurred before our project in that targeted design storm, that two of the 10 year storm. But we're not really treating, in this case or in that case, you're not treating the cause of the runoff or the problem that may be uh, caused by the runoff. You're actually just treating the symptom. So if you think of it as you're treating the symptom, but you're not really treating the condition. And you're targeting certain storms, like a two-year storm or a 10-year storm, where other storms that may occur could, you could still have impact from that. So it's, it's, it is, um, that's what, what we're typically doing in a, in a typical development. This development is different. This development, we're committing to a reduction in impervious surface on the site. So, and committing to incorporation of low impact development and green stormwater infrastructure devices, all of those to reduce and eliminate the runoff potential for the site. And so if you reduce the potential for runoff from the site, it works in every single design storm, not just those targeted storms, but you're reducing runoff for every, for every storm that would occur <clears throat> on that site. And so in a condition like this, I sort of um, you know, compare that to treating the condition and not just treating the symptom. So you're treating the cause of the problem and not just you know, treating the symptom at the end with a device um, you know, to, to just mitigate <coughs> that impact. So for this site, we are create, uh, committing to that reduction of impervious surface and incorporation of those techniques, uh, low impact development and green stormwater infrastructure techniques together to have that impervious surface reduction. So um, I would also like to mention that Dr. Bill Hunt was here also to speak um, on this stormwater plan. We've been in collaboration with him. He wasn't able to stay. He has some time constraints, but I just wanted to mention that he was here and it had to and intended to speak. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker. <clears throat> uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, Bob Zumwalt from McAdams. Uh, I'm a landscape architect, have been for 25 years, and I'm director of planning and design there. I also wanted to just take a couple minutes uh, to talk about two particular items at Cary Town Center, uh, redesign the tree canopy and open space. Uh, first, let me talk about the tree canopy. The project, as you know, committed to planting uh, 1,100 new canopy trees within the project. So this term canopy tree would be synonymous with an upper story tree from the LDO, uh, Cary's LDO. The design guidebook further describes that the minimum mature diameter of these trees would cover the pedestrian corridor of all the, street, uh, all the streets within the project. So if we look at the pedestrian corridors, that would dictate that the canopies at maturity would be ranging from 17 to 43 feet in diameter. Uh, there would also be trees additionally in the community gathering areas, the private rec areas, um, which added all together, if you add up the trees in the circulation corridors, the open space areas and the buffers, we could conservatively calculate the canopy at roughly 19 and a quarter acres on the site, which would be 22% of the site. One other quick point on open space, there was a comment raised by a Cary citizen um, recently that made reference to 2% open space on the site. I wanted to just touch on this real quick. While we haven't designed the site, we can co extrapolate the amount of open space that would be on the site conservatively uh, as follows. In the perimeter street yards and buffers, we estimate about six and a half acres of open space. Internal circulation corridors, the, the green space uh, along those corridors are about another four and a half acres. We've committed to a minimum of two, and a, two acres of community gathering. Uh, and then there would be private recreation spaces with each residential community, which we would estimate somewhere in the one to three acre range. So conservatively, if you add these up, that's 14 to 16 acres of open space, which is 16 to 18% of the site. So I just want to clarify that because it was a little confusing. Um, that's all I've got. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Any other speakers for Public Speaks Out? Anyone at all? Seeing no one will close, public speaks out. And we move to the consent agenda, which is item six. Uh, for the benefit of people watching our meeting on TV, I'm going to take a moment to read the consent agenda items. Please keep in mind that one vote approves all consent agenda items. On the consent agenda, we have minutes. Attorneys update State Farm Fire and Casualty Company as 
Subrigy of Diana Henson <coughs> Utility Services Associates LLC in Town of Cary. Jordan Lake Round 4 Water Supply Allocation Contract. New Singular Wireless PCS License Agreement. Rejection of bids for the Paramount Outfall and Pump Station Elimination Project. Request to waive the one-year waiting period for a subsequent rezoning application. Act 8, Land <coughs> Development Ordinance and Community Appearance Manual Amendments. Would council members like any of these items pulled for discussion? If not, I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. There's a motion. Second. And a second. Discussion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion is unanimous. We now move to our public hearings. Same rules apply for public hearings that apply for public speaks out with one exception. Our speakers now have five minutes each for their comments instead of three. Our first public hearing is the consideration of a project development agreement for an economic development and downtown development project. Manager Stiegel will introduce the item or Mr. Boyd? I, I'll just <coughs> A few brief words. Okay, uh, Manager Stiegel will introduce the yeah. item and then uh, Mr. Boyd will present the staff's report. Mr. Stiegel. Um, some, some projects uh, take longer than others because some projects are more complicated than others. <clears throat> and this uh, project, um, certainly in my career, and I've only seen the last three years, since the last year, is about as complicated as they come. And to, uh, to achieve a success in a project like this, you first and foremost requires a very special developer and a local developer uh, such as Jordan and George, the Jordans as we refer to them, uh, is certainly a necessary ingredient in this. Having a community partner such as a church and having a very patient community and council are all essential elements because the moving parts here are of great magnitude. And so while there's still some work ahead of us and Ted's gonna detail that, uh, certainly this evening represents uh, a testament to this community's patience and a willingness and a resilience to continue plowing forward on the community's downtown redevelopment. Uh, this will help uh, alleviate traffic and parking issues um, and it certainly makes a difference in our storm water management efforts which is good and as a reminder to our community when we do new projects downtown we make the situation better not worse. So with that I'll turn it over to Ted Boyd. Thank you, Mr. Siegel, and good evening, Council. Uh, for your consideration tonight is a project development agreement for both an economic development and downtown development project. <coughs> the staff report atta and attached documents cover this agreement in detail, and I would like to highlight four areas. The background, the key terms, fiscal impacts, and next steps. First, a little background. As we are nearing our 150th anniversary of the founding of Cary, it is important to note that for the first 100 of those 150 years, Cary grew from a few hundred to only a few thousand residents. Starting in the 1960s, Cary grew quickly, doubling in population every 10 years until early 2000. During this period of significant growth, while the outer edges of the town grew out, the original core of the town did not keep pace as a destination. Seeing that challenge, Town Council approved the Town Center Area Plan in 2001, which set the vision to make downtown a unique, vibrant, dynamic, pedestrian-friendly location with a focus on multi-level mixed-use buildings so that downtown would include an exciting mix of shops, restaurants, entertainment, housing, and offices, all within walking distance of transit. This plan was further supported by the establishment of a Downtown Business Improvement District in 2012, and the adoption of the Imagine Carry 2040 Community Plan in 2017. The Imagine Carry Community Plan identifies downtown Cary as a special planning area consisting of six sub areas, including the central Chatham sub area, and articulates policies and visions for the downtown special planning area and its sub areas. As stated in the plan, the central Chatham sub area, or Cary's Main Street, will be transformed into a vibrant mixed-use corridor with shops, restaurants, studios, and sidewalk vendors. It will be the primary destination for dining, entertainment, and shopping. It will be a neighborhood with a variety of living options with resident, where residents can obtain their daily needs within a short walk. 
Multi-story buildings and street trees will frame the street and add housing and office space. For more than 10 years, George Jordan has envisioned the redevelopment of the southeast corner of the Harrison Avenue and Chatham Street, uh, which is within the central Chatham sub-area. The property which he owns at the corner, and you can see just uh, the, the framing and the aerial there, um, was the original homestead of Henry George, a founding council member of the town of Cary in 1871, and later mayor of Cary in 1903. <coughs> the First Baptist Church Cary has been a staple of downtown Cary since 1874 and continues to be part of the fabric of Academy Street. I'd like to acknowledge Pastor Pat Kilby, as well as the Chair of the Properties and Facilities Committee, Keith Stevens, along with all of the committee members for their support, diligence, and thoughtful work on this project. To help avoid confusion, I'll use the term developer to refer to George Jordan and his team, Church for First Baptist Church, Cary, and uh, Cary for Cary. Um, <laughs> The highlighted areas uh, on the aerial include property owned by the developer in blue, the church in yellow, and Cary in red, and these properties are the focus of the proposed agreement. Council conducted two work sessions on the proposed agreement which discussed the basic terms that now comprise the project and directed staff to finalize a draft <sighs> agreement for council consideration. The project is a vertically and horizontally integrated mixed-use development which is on the site that results from the exchange, sale, and resubdivision of property owned by the developer, Cary, and the church. The specific details for the exchange, sale, and resubdivision of the property is captured in the attachments to the staff report. The following are the private elements to be constructed by the developer. 180 Class A multifamily apartments, <coughs> 50,000 square foot commercial building uh, labeled Commercial Building 1, which would have office and ground floor retail. Uh, commercial Building 2, which would be 10,000 uh, square feet, focused predominantly on retail, food, and beverage. These elements reflect a $51 million private investment to this underutilized property. Once completed, it could reflect an assessed tax value to carry of approximately $120,000 annually which would be a 3,100% increase over the current assessed tax value of the property. The addition of a Class A office space, ground floor retail with restaurants and shops, along with 180 apart 88 apartments will stimulate the downtown economy and promote business. And based upon the developer's experience as an employer, landlord, and developer, this project will result in a substantial number of jobs, 150, in downtown, will pay at or above the median average wage in Wake County. The following are the elements Cary is responsible for constructing. Public driveways, curbs, sidewalks, landscaping, and stormwater drainage and collection facilities, and a stormwater detention facility. 466 space parking deck, and after construction, 244 spaces will be purchased by the developer at a purchase price that is equal to the cost of construction. This price is supported by an appraisal, which is attached to the staff report. The project has several ancillary agreements addressed in the staff report, three of which I'm highlighting here. Reservation release of carry-owned parking spaces for private development during regular <laughs> business hours, temporary and permanent easements for church parking in the 222 carry-owned spaces on Sunday mornings, and a relocation agreement for the Ivy Ellington House. For this project to move forward, the Ivy Ellington House would need to be relocated. Kerry owns this property and the resolution that council unanimously approved at the beginning of this meeting demonstrates Kerry's commitment to the Ivy Ellington House and directs the town manager and town staff to use their best efforts to work with the Kerry Historic Preservation Commission, the Friends of the Page Walker Hotel, the State Historic Preservation Office to identify a suitable location for the relocation of the house in a manner that preserves its national designation and that best practices will be applied in relocating the house to assure the structural integrity of the house is man maintained. The fiscal impact of this project are reflected in the chart above. Carrie's total commitment of the project is $13,820,000. Carrie has already appropriated $5 million for this initiative based on direction at a previously reference council work session. 
As stated in the resolution, staff requests that council recognize the $6,415,506 of anticipated developer funding and appropriate an additional $2,404,494 from the general fund fund balance for a total appropriation of $13,820,000. As stated earlier, the addition of Class A office space, ground floor retail, with restaurants and shops along with 180 apartments will stimulate the downtown economy, promote business, and this project will result in 150 jobs in downtown that will pay at or above the median average wage in Wake County. The resolution attached to the staff report makes the required determinations and authorizes and approves the agreement and the appropriation and expenditure of funds. In terms of next steps, if approved, the church would take a congregational vote on the project in early 2020. Following that vote, the developer, church, and carry will execute the agreement establishing the effective date of the agreement. The effective date would begin a 120-day inspection period, which is the first step within the overall closing period, which can be no longer than 20 <coughs> Uh, this concludes my presentation, and following the public hearing, I'm happy to address any questions. Thank you, Mr. Boyd. Now's the time for the public hearing for item 7.1, consideration of a project development agreement for an economic development and downtown development project, and I would invite our first speaker forward. <clears throat> Mayor Weinbrick, members of town council, my name is George Jordan and I'm a partner with Northwoods Associates along with my other partner and nephew Jordan Gussenhoven. Um, as y'all know, this has uh, been a long process and I want to thank the town, um, the town of Cary and the First Baptist Church for their patience and cooperation and willingness to work with a plan that I think we can all uh, support. In particular, I want to thank um, the Properties and Facilities Committee of the First Baptist Church uh, that started with John Linderman as, as, as the first chair and now Keith Stevens, who I believe is here tonight, uh, that is chairing the committee now. Um, also, uh, our, our development partner, Northview Partners, Mark Barker, who's been with us from the beginning, uh, working with the town and the church. Ted Boyd, Sean Stiegel, even going back to Ed Goff and Ben Shiver, we've been working on this a long time, and um, I know there's some of you tonight that maybe wondered if we'd ever get here tonight, but uh, here we are. As Ted pointed out, this is a complicated uh, development agreement that's taken many years. There's a lot of property exchanges, a lot of swaps, a lot of post and uh, post closing, uh, pre closing uh, uh, agreements, and agreements even afterwards that will allow our different stakeholders' operations to continue to thrive and grow in a, uh, in a growing downtown carry. I don't think, you know, I don't know if there's any such thing as a perfect plan, but I know we've worked really hard to get to this point, and I'm excited about it hopefully coming to fruition soon. I also wanted to say um, there's two individuals I want to acknowledge, and that was my father, uh, Buck Jordan and Jeff Sugg, who were developers and builders back in the early, or in the mid 50s to the early 80s. Um, <coughs> in fact, Buck Jordan, had, back in the late 60s, early 70s, had acquired the property at uh, Walnut Street and Maynard Road, and later brought in C.B. Jones to develop the Cary Village Mall that later became the Cary Town Center, and is so excited to hear about what Turnbridge is, is getting ready to do. Now, they were both colorful characters, my dad and Jeff. Um, they were, if you knew them, but uh, they were good people and uh, a good sense of humor, good businessmen, and they were good friends. And um, in fact, Jeff was a pallbearer at my father's uh, funeral back in 1983. My dad built the uh, office building at the intersection of Chatham and Harrison back in 1960, and it was called the professional building back then, and uh, it housed doctors, uh, um, um, insurance companies and my father's uh, place of business and it was a family business until a few years ago so we were there a long time as um, Ted pointed out my great-great-grandfather was also lived on a portion of that site and um, so it, it goes back a long ways but about 15 years ago um, I bought the additional property from Jeff Sugg between our building and the uh, Ivy, uh, the property where the Ivy Ellington house sits. And I remember Mr. Sugg saying, you've got an opportunity to really do something special on this corner. 
well that that opportunity elevated uh, when the town purchased uh, the sug property when he passed away in 2010 the residual property so uh, a decade later you know after that we're here and tonight i'm hopeful that we can the council will vote to move forward on the execution so we can move forward on the execution of this development agreement thank you thank you mr jordan next speaker please <clears throat> <clears throat> Good evening, Mayor Weinreck and Council, and congratulations, Representative Liu. It is, uh, I wish you the very best in your new role. Uh, my name is John Loyak, and I'm here on behalf of the Friends of the Page Walker. Uh, over any given year, the Friends of the Page Walker find themselves engaged in a variety of different activities around historic preservation, but we also find ourselves involved in things like cultural events, youth leadership programs, history education programs, and certainly you can find us out maintaining historic sites around town from time to time. We did all those things this year while also working very closely with town staff on several important initiatives. Uh, this was a year where this council went to great lengths to protect Cary's historic treasures, and that was proven by the acquisition of the Nancy Jones House, new budget line items for historic preservation, the creation of the historic preservation planner position on town staff and much more. The friends appreciate all these efforts and we are very grateful that we have leadership in our town who have such a vision. The resolution that you just approved is another sign of your dedication to the history of Cary. It may seem like a small gesture, but it provides Cary citizens with assurances regarding how the relocation of the Ivy Ellington will be held. As I wrote my comments this evening, uh, there were a few things I wanted to close with. Uh, two very basic recommendations. I think we've already covered them, though. Uh, we've covered them both in the resolution and in Ted's comments. But I'll just say that uh, in an ideal world, I think any involvement of the State Historic Preservation Office, keeping them consulted, uh, listening to them for their advice regarding the new location of the Ivy Ellington House, uh, would certainly help assure the National Register status is maintained and that the capital area preservation uh, team be consulted and its advice followed to assure minimum uh, disruption to the structure and the move. So again, thank you for your time. Thank you for all you've done to preserve so many of our historic treasures. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else to speak at this public hearing? Could you move to your left, please? Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. I came this evening. Could you state your name for the record? Yes, I'm sorry. That's Mary okay. Collins. Thank you. I came tonight because um, I was not sure whether the resolution that was uh, passed tonight would pass. Um, and although I'm just a citizen of the town, I have a great deal of love for the Ivy Ellington Waddell House and love to go to the farmer's market there on Saturdays. So I had um, remarks regarding serious concerns I had about some of the things that have happened with uh, historic properties in the past and what might happen this time. So I'm really heartened to hear everything that's happened at this meeting and the commitment to uh, preserve the Ivy Ellington House and to make sure that it's in pride of place and really a part of the downtown. So, um, and ha not having attended a meeting for quite some time, I'm so impressed with everything that has gone on here. I'm proud to be a Cary citizen. So thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Justin Porter, and um, well, I, basically y'all are doing pretty much everything that we wanted y'all to do, so it's really great, but I wrote this thing and I want to read it. Uh, so, um, you know, um, many years ago we had this home that was given to the town of Cary with the trust that would be preserved and remain a part of the history and the charm of downtown. Through the years it's been a welcoming reminder that what lies beyond its location is a beautiful charming town that offers something unique to all that pass through. 
a place where small local businesses have the opportunity to be seen and supported. And for me personally, as a videographer by profession, it's the best place to walk around and just clear your thoughts with the sights and sounds of what feels like a small town while capturing video of how lucky we all are to have this rare gem of a place of a, of a town like this to ourselves. I believe innovation is a good thing. I've been here all my life and know what technology and growth can bring to a town. I still remember life before Maynard Loop was even a word. Currently, there's a tremendous growth plan that's taking place actually on both ends of downtown Cary, uh, adding over a million square feet of commercial space, 1,500 housing options on one location. and the the. The last thing a lot of us and uh, as citizens and downtown business owners expected would be the addition of multiple apartments, very expensive condos and parking decks all throughout downtown Cary. It's surprising because the biggest selling point about the downtown area, looking at my time, uh, selling point about the downtown area is the charm of not being that type of town. And once that's gone, there is no getting it back, but you know, innovation. When and if they move the Ining Ivy Ellington, this see, I wrote this before, you know, we knew for sure y'all gonna move it, but you're gonna move it, that, which that's okay. Um, it, but <coughs> did you know that with this whole new four story parking deck and apartment complex, one of the things I really love is the way the sun sets on the Methodist church across the street from our studio. And it, it almost makes me wanna cry when I think about that going away. And I know it's gonna go away because the town's gonna keep growing, but I really love the sunset over on the church and the stained glass. And that, that really does make me sad. Uh, we all watched as the Maiden home was bulldozed after a relocation and a promise. Both of y'all blamed each other. The whole, you know, Maiden Inn blamed y'all, y'all blamed the Maiden Inn. You know, nobody wanted to fix it. And so the house, you know, was bulldozed and, it, and everyone blamed each other and it was a loss for everyone. So we're just asking that you don't let it happen again. Uh, I hope that you move forward uh, with uh, both the general, uh, basically what I'm asking for is just clarity. We just want clarity and make sure that we just know exactly that the, the house is structurally sound and where it's going and how you're going to do it and when it's going to happen and where it's going to go. We just want details, you know, and no ambiguities and no secrecy, no NDAs. We just want to know what's going on. And that's all. So thanks for your consideration. Thank Bye, y'all. Next speaker, please. <clears throat> Hello, uh, my name is Nick Barso, and uh, you'll have to forgive me because I'm an engineer, so I think practically in, when I see plans like this. Uh, and I wanted to express my concern over a, a number of things that I see in this plan. And um, number one, the idea of us, uh, and I'm not sure exactly of the details here, but to force all of this water into a stormwater detention area that's the size of an Olympic sized swimming pool seems unrealistic, especially some of the storms that we've experienced in the past. So I'm not sure exactly how that's going to happen. But one of the, my requests in this uh, design that you have is I went, took my dogs for a walk today, and I had two near misses at intersections that were identified as walk, walking areas with, uh, you know, with uh, the, the, the the walking sign and still was a near miss. The other one was at the library where we don't even have a development surrounding that library. And um, somebody came through from the parking deck and clearly visible. I was wearing an electric blue top, so it wasn't like uh, I was blending in with the background. So my concern is with this traffic pattern that you're expecting to have come in and out of this parking deck because it doesn't seem realistic. I used to live in an apartment complex off of Weston, and I know how people come out of those uh, parking decks. When you're coming downhill, you don't necessarily think about hitting the brakes. And what's nice about this area between uh, Academy and <coughs> Chatham is that you can cross the street without worrying about getting hit. I don't think that that's a consideration in this plan. I don't see any gates. I don't see any signals. Um, I also would like you to, to consider the fact that, you know, we're looking at, this, at a design that looks like it was from the 90s. And my concern is that with climate change, you know, that to incorporate things like solar panels, um, you know, um, electric car charging stations, those kinds of items into this design would be appropriate as far as I'm concerned. I think that the whether you agree with it or not, the climate issue is going to be a thing. 
and uh, and I think that that needs to be incorporated into this design as well. So um, I'm not a fan of the necessarily the township or the town supporting you know co-sponsoring these types of projects. But if we're going to have to live with it, I would ask you to make some practical decisions around this. Uh, so that we're making wise decisions. We don't have to look at it in hindsight <coughs> and say, well, we should have done this when we had a chance when it was a lot less uh, costly to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else for this public hearing? Anyone at all? Seeing no one, we'll close the public hearing, open it up to council members for questions or comments or a motion. <coughs> <coughs> And start off. Um, first and foremost, I too would like to thank the uh, property and facilities committees, the membership, and everyone at First Baptist Church. Uh, I would like to thank George and Jordan, um, everyone from Northwoods, um, and as well as Cary Town staff, Ted, um, and people that were here before you got here. This has been a long uh, project. It's been a long time in the works. Um, over 10 years. I can only remember one other project that took about this long to get to this point, and that was a uh, Silverton City <coughs> project that we dealt with for about a decade until we came up with something that was satisfactory to the surrounding community as well as the developer. Um, one thing that I'm really <coughs> glad and I'm excited about this project is you know, so often we hear about developers coming in and they just build something, throw it up, and make their money and leave. And that is not the case here. That is anything but the case here with a local family developer um, and a partner in the church who have long, deep roots to this community. Um, we heard, you know, some of the comments from, from George, from Mr. Jordan, and um, that speaks to how much he cares about this community and how much he wants to make it a better place and give back to the community that has provided so much for him and his family over the years. With him, it's not about making a buck. It's about doing something remarkable for the community and helping us move towards the future and work on the vision that we've set forth. This isn't our vision. This isn't anybody at this table's vision. This isn't staff's vision you know this, this is the community's vision this is the vision that was first created in 01 with the town center area plan and then reaffirmed in 17 with the Cary community plan um, numerous meetings and other things throughout the years this is when we engaged our citizens thousands of citizens in creating the Cary community plan this is the, the sort of development they, they said they wanted. They wanted a live, work, play environment. They wanted walkability. They wanted to, you know, retail and shopping in downtown. They, want, they wanted additional housing. Um, you know, somebody mentioned the, the Facebook comments or whatever. You know, trust me, read them daily. Um, <coughs> respond to them daily. Um, and there, there's a there's a small segment out there who, for some reason, has a stigma about apartments. <coughs> that, that always it bothers me and it concerns me that you know one who are we keeping from coming to downtown and and why? When I first moved to Cary, I stumbled upon Cary, found it by luck, you know, loaded up all my stuff in a truck and moved down here moved into the first apartment I could find because it's all I could find. And I was so blessed that that apartment existed and, and I was able to move into it and um, start my the next chapter of my life in Cary. Um, when my kids you know, went off to college and came back, a lot of them, first thing they did was move into an apartment. It's what they could afford you know, while they saved up to buy that first little starter home. One did that in, in Apex, and then they were able a couple of years later to get enough equity in that and finally come back to Cary. When my, my mother, I think as many of you know, is, you know, we, we moved her down here from Virginia so we could take care of her. Um, she could no longer live in a house by herself. We found a nice apartment for her. Um, so to me, the apartments provide wonderful places for our, our kids to hopefully get them to come back and stay in Cary. 
um, young professionals and our seniors who, are, who need or are looking for easier living. So and I think that's one housing stock that, or type of housing that we don't have in downtown that we need. And I think that if we're going to create an urban, walkable, um, live, work, play environment in downtown, it, it is something we need. When it's designed like this, um, with, with parking and, and beautiful sidewalks and, and, par and also partnerships, not just with the town, but with the church and, and, and such, I, I think that really you know, creates buy-in and, and it results in something truly mar remarkable because so many people are involved and care about it. Um, I'm so thrilled with the resolution that we, that staff and the Friends of the Page Walker help us come, uh, come up with to address the Ivy Ellington because that was a legit concern. Um, and and I, I believe we, the passing a separate le resolution was the right way and not doing it as part of this agreement because it demonstrates our commitment to preserving that house. It was, I understand it, but it was a little surprising to me to hear some of the concerns coming out here towards the end because we've been sitting here for years talking about how much we love that house and we're going to preserve that house and how much that house means to our community and um, so yeah I guess passing a resolution that states exactly that was probably the right thing remove all doubt so I, I think that's great I've said it before I'll say it again I actually liked the original plan where it took the Ivy Ellington and just turned it sideways and uh, included it in this project and kept it on its original site. I applaud the developer for trying to do that and keep it on this location, realizing what that meant to the community and not wanting to see it moved off its original site. I totally understand where some of the preservationist folks are coming from. Um, and the concern about it losing its national register status should it not front a beautiful Main Street type thing. So I, I get that. So, but I, I always wonder, do we care more about the house or do we care more about the designation? Um, but I do think we can do both. And I think that we're going to work to do both. So that's good. Um, I, th I think it's a little funny that, well, or ironic, I guess, Jackie used that word earlier today, that a church is involved in this project because for 10 years we've had to keep the faith that this thing was going to happen. <laughs> and, and here we are, hopefully, hopefully, um, and you know, coming towards the conclusion um, of what I know will be a wonderful, remarkable project <clears throat> and help make downtown Cary an even better place to live, work, and um, just be more remarkable. So I'm excited about this. I'm looking forward to it, and I hope everybody else is. Other comments? This this plan, is, as everyone has said, has been bouncing around for about 10 years now, which shows that this corner of Harrison and Chatham was ripe for development even 10 years ago before it became fashionable to redevelop downtown. And now 10 years later, it's even riper. And throughout these 10 years, I've been a big supporter of this project, with, of course, that one exception, which is the Ivy Ellington, which we've talked to death by now tonight, I guess. Um, but three years ago, and here's where the family disagrees. This is an example of this. Uh, three years ago, we saw a rendition of this plan, which took the Ivy Ellington and moved it sideways off the street next to a dumpster. And tonight, which I guess could have been okay for some council members. Uh, but tonight we have this resolution, which really shows how far we've come, I think, in, in three years of historic preservation. We've come so far that I plan to support the uh, staff recommendation tonight, which is something I would not have done even a short time ago. I'm proud of our downtown, and I'm amazed at the faith that so many people have in it that they're willing to invest so much time and money to making it even better. I'm also proud of our history and heritage downtown and throughout the town, and not just the buildings themselves, but the men and women who lived and worked in these buildings, who laid the foundation, almost literally in some cases, for us to build upon and make the downtown even greater than it is today, which includes the great-great-grandfather of George Jordan who served on our original town council and was a friend of Frank Page himself. 
So I hope we've learned a little bit as we've traveled through the last 10 years, especially during the last three, and we've learned that we shouldn't be hiding our history next to a dumpster, but highlighting it and showcasing it whenever we can. And I think what we have tonight will do that. Other comments, questions, or a motion? Well, I'll just say I'm glad about the resolution. <clears throat> so I think that was the appropriate thing to do. Um, I think we still need to really be open and transparent about our planning, as one of the speakers requested. You know, be be really clear about what the plan is for the house. And it's not one of these things that we want to wait to the last minute to try to figure out how to handle. So we need to be very aggressive about that. Uh, the only reservation I really have about this um, proposal here is the view shed of the parking deck from Academy. And I just hope that at some point in the future, that green space that you see there, which I believe is owned by the church and maybe partly owned by the town, will be <coughs> developed into something that will somehow screen the parking deck a little bit from Academy. Because I don't, I don't think that's that particular element of it is the, is the best element for this project, but um, it's only one element, so it's not worth voting against the project because of that, but I do think we need to be cognizant of it going forward. I'm glad you brought that up because I was, I, I was um, thankful for the citizen who came up and spoke about uh, things that we could be doing to enhance the parking deck, and we've had lots of conversations about, you know, we, our, our new parking deck for the library has electric charging vehicles. I can't imagine we would do another parking deck without electric charging vehicle. Um, but we've also talked, as this council has talked, about solar panels on, on rooftops. I remember um, Council Member George spoke about it many times when we had already gone too far down the road, but it is something that we should consider. We've talked about green roofs, right? We've talked about a lot of opportunities, and, and they're also in the EAB recommendations. This is a building that's going, or a, another deck that's being built by us, mm -hmm. In, in a sense, um, and in the appraisal uh, that I read of with respect to the deck, none of those details are there, although it talks about a class A parking deck with a high-end facade. And so I hope that as the plans mature, that we see that, because Carrie is often the leader, not the follower, and if we want some of our citizens to do these types of things as well in their homes, we should be leading and being a role model for doing those things as they come forward. It's not going to prohibit me from supporting this. I just think there's opportunities for us to be forward thinking. Other comments, questions, or That's motion? All been said. Yeah. Make a motion that we're for the consider <coughs> approved consideration of project development agreement for economic development in the downtown development project. There's a motion. Um, second. And a second. Oh, excuse yes. me, Mr. France, if you could um, move to adopt the resolution. Move to adopt the resolution. <laughs> As Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I second that. Really. Second. <laughs> Everybody clear about where where we are on this motion. All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion's unanimous. Thank you, Mr. Boyd. Thank you, Council. And thank you, Mr. Jordan, for all you're doing. We now move to our second public hearing, 19A15. Ruth. <coughs> Elite Sosa Annexation Planning Manager Wayne Nicholas will introduce the item and Council may take action. Mr. Nicholas. Thank you. Good evening, Council. Uh, this request is for annexation of 1.25 acres located at 503 Country Lane uh, in the northeast corner of the Reedy Creek Road and Country Lane intersection. Uh, the property is contiguous to the corporate limits. Uh, it's located within Carey's ETJ and zone residential 40. Uh, the request is not associated with a development plan or rezoning. The property owner wishes to connect the existing dwelling on the site to a town water service. Uh, in accordance with the town's regulations, the property must be annexed before it can connect to the utilities. Uh, in reviewing this request, there were concerns about providing solid waste services to the property from Country Lane. Uh, Country Lane is not public right of way, it's a private access easement, which is shown here on this slide in yellow. Uh, and it's adjacent to this property and extends over several other private properties. Uh, it's not constructed to town standards and does not have a turnaround area for solid waste trucks. So in, re in response to the concerns, the owners of the property <coughs> indicated that they accept the delivery of solid waste services along the frontage uh, of the property at Reedy Creek Road. Uh, they have been provided with, or they have provided the town with a signed disclosure and indemnity 
uh, to be recorded at the Registry of Deeds should the property be annexed. The disclosure will provide notice to future owners of the property uh, of the location of solid waste services. It also gives the town the option to provide services uh, from Country Lane in the future if it's improved in a way that the town believes provides for access by solid waste vehicles. Uh, so based on the documentation that's been provided by the property owners, staff recommends that if council chooses to annex the property, that it be with the understanding that solid waste services would be provided at Reedy Creek Robe as described in the disclosure document that was attached to the staff report. Thank you, Mr. Nicholas. Now's the time for the public hearing for 19A15 annexation, and I would invite our first speaker forward. Anyone to speak at this public hearing? Seeing no one, we'll close the public hearing. Open it up to council members for questions, comments, or a motion. Uh, I'll make a motion that uh, we move forward with annexation 19A15. Second. Motion and a second. Discussion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion's unanimous. We'll move to our third public hearing, 19A16, Smith & Smith Developers, LLC, and Dold Annexation. And once again, Mr. Nicholas will introduce the item, and council may take action. Mr. Nicholas. Thank you. Uh, this request is for annexation of portions of two adjacent properties uh, that are located at <coughs> 6118 and 6120 Blanche Drive. Uh, the total area proposed for the annexation is 1.02 acres. Uh, the area is contiguous to the corporate limits. It's located within CARES DTJ and currently zoned Residential 12. Uh, this slide shows the proposed annexation area outlined in red. Uh, the two existing properties that each have portions of their areas within the overall annexation boundary are shown in yellow and purple. Uh, and the dashed line is the existing boundary between them. The red line also represents the proposed boundary of a new lot two as shown on a recently recorded recombination plat that adjusts the existing boundary between the two properties. Uh, although the plat was recorded, transferring ownership between the existing properties to create the new <coughs> recombined lots one and lot two uh, has not yet been completed and will require some additional time. The request is not associated with a development plan or rezoning. Staff understands that the new owner of lot two is proposing to create up to three lots uh, from the proposed annexation area as an exempt subdivision and connect those lots <coughs> to the town utilities. Each of the new lots will need to meet the dimensional standards of the R12 zoning, and in accordance with the town's regulations, the properties must be annexed before they can connect to utilities. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Nicholas. Now it's time for the public hearing 19A16, Smith & Smith Developers, LLC, and Dold Annexation, and I would invite our first speaker forward. Anyone to speak at this public hearing? Seeing no one, we'll close the public hearing, open it up to council members for questions, comments, or a motion. Make a motion to approve annexation 19A16. There's a motion. Second. And the second. Discussion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Nicholas. We now move to our fourth public hearing, 19A11, Branston LLC annexation. Planner Aaron Puckett, first time presenter. Welcome. Yeah. <laughs> we'll introduce the item, <coughs> and council will not take action on this item. It'll return to us at a future day for consideration. Ms. Puckett. Good evening, Mayor and Council. This next annexation may look familiar. As you might recall, a public hearing for the associated rezoning case on this property was held at your November 21st meeting. So this request is for annexation of 6.54 acres of property located at 1033 Furson Road, approximately 550 feet west of the Morrisville Parkway and Furson Road intersection. The annexation also includes a 0.25 acre portion of the adjacent Furson Road right of way. The property is contiguous to the town's corporate limits, but is outside of Cary's ETJ, located in Wake County, and is currently zoned Wake County Residential 40 Watershed. Since the applicant wishes to develop the site under Cary's zoning and regulations, it is necessary to bring the property into the town limits and establish a Cary's zoning designation. In conjunction with the annexation, the previously mentioned rezoning request for the property has also been submitted, and again, the public hearing for that request was conducted last month, and the case was forwarded to the Planning and Zoning Board for their review. The proposed zoning would increase the permitted residential density above that allowed under the current zoning, allowing for the creation of a maximum of six lots for detached dwellings. Following the public hearing on the annexation, no action by council is needed this evening, the petition will be placed on a future meeting agenda so the action may coincide with final action on the associated rezoning request. 
This concludes staff's presentation, and following the public hearing, we are available for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Puckett. Now it's time for annexation 19A11, Branston LLC annexation, and I would invite our first speaker forward. Anyone to speak at this public hearing? Seeing no one, we'll close the public hearing and open up to council members for questions or comments. If not, we'll see this at a later date. Thank you, Ms. Puckett. Thank you. <clears throat> now move to our fifth public hearing, 19A17, Pentagraph Evangelist Hiller, Hilliard and Presser Annexation. And once again, Ms. Puckett will introduce the item and council will not take action on this item as well. So this next request is for annexation of five properties totaling approximately 32 acres located on Alston Avenue at the southwest corner of Alston Avenue and NC 540. The annexation also includes a 10.5 acre portion of the adjacent NC 540 right of way. The properties are contiguous to the existing corporate limits. They are located within Cary's ETJ and are currently zoned residential 40 and are also within the mixed use overlay district. The properties are also part of the Alston Activity Center concept plan approved in 2006. The request is associated with a development plan that proposes 184 townhomes within the area for which annexation is requested. In accordance with the ordinance, the property must be annexed before the development plan can be approved. That plan is currently in the review process and based on provisions of the LDO and the number of dwellings proposed, must be reviewed and approved by the Zoning Board of Adjustment following a quasi-judicial hearing. Following the public hearing on the annexation, no action by council is needed this evening. A public hearing on the associated development plan will be conducted by that Zoning Board of Adjustment at a future date. And if the plan is approved, it will be conditioned on the property being annexed. At that point, the annexation request will return to council for final action. This concludes staff's pre presentation and following the hearing will be available for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Puckett. Now's the time for the public hearing for 19A17, <coughs> Pentagraph Evangelist Hilliard and Presser Annexation. And I would invite our first speaker forward. Anyone to speak at this public hearing? Seeing no one, we'll close the public hearing, open it up to council members for questions or comments. Yep. Seeing none. Thank you, Ms. Puckett. We'll move on. We'll see this at a future date. We move now to our discussion items. Item 8.1, 19REZ11, Cary Town Center, PDP. Mr. Stiegel will introduce the item and planning director, Scott Berry, and principal planner, Katie Dry, and award winner, uh, will present the report. <laughs> And council may take action this evening. Mr. Stiegel. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad you got to see Aaron for the first time, and you can see that uh, the future of the planning department is as good as the present. Um, with that, uh, for you, uh, another very important project, and uh, you, know, you can really get a sense, at least I've uh, felt in my career, on how a project is going to turn out the minute you meet the development team that walks in seeking your approval. And from the minute um, Jamie introduced us to Turnbridge, I have witnessed time and again a desire by them to meet the council and the community's expectations. When I walked in the first time and we met with them, they, they didn't have a plan. <coughs> they had a, a message, and that message was that they wanted to develop something with the community. And again, that's something you hear a lot. But it doesn't always bear itself out uh, in reality. And with Turnbridge, that has been exactly the case. They have sought throughout this process, and they've been successful in time and time again meeting the council's expectations and requests. And when there was those requests that they weren't quite able to meet, they made every effort to demonstrate why it wasn't consistent uh, with their vision for this. Uh, they're a first-class team. They've been presenting a first-class development. And I want to thank them for uh, investing in Cary. And I hope this leads to a lot more investment by Turnbridge. And want to uh, thank the council for your active involvement in this project. And, uh, and to, the, uh, to the tree folks who have been inspired by the conversations here. And certainly nobody's been more inspired than Jack through this effort. <laughs> we are affectionately referring to him as Jackie Appleseed now. Oh. Um, we are going to do great things when it comes to trees. We're on the verge of that. Staff's working on some very special things, and we appreciate the, count, the, the community and the council inspiring us to do more through the conversations related to this development, and the developer has met that as well. Finally, you'll hear in a moment, uh, consistent with all new development, on how when we redevelop it or develop new, 
we try to solve existing problems. And to do that, you certainly and always need the help of the developer. Stormwater is a concern in this community. Once again, stormwater gets better uh, as a result of the partnership and working with the, the, uh, Turnbridge. So with that, I'll turn it over to our talented staff and Scott Berry. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council, and thanks, Sean, for the introductory remarks. I'm very pleased to be here tonight to give another brief remark uh, before we get started with the rezoning case. Um, following what I, my, my uh, time up here, Katie will give an overview of the plan. She'll discuss what's changed since the work session and give staff's analysis how this plan helps achieve Imagine Carry. Since the beginning of this year, staff has worked closely with Turnbridge Properties. This collaborative approach has resulted in the rezoning application evolving. The applicant has responded to feedback from the council, from staff, and from citizens. Located in the Eastern Cary Gateway, this site is one of the first major redevelopment opportunities that we have had. The plan takes a dying mall and reinvents it by transforming parking lots into a place where citizens can truly live, work, and play. It creates a new urban <clears throat> grid with office, residential, and supporting retail. Much of what you will see before you tonight is similar to the initial plan that was submitted in April. And I think this is a testament to the quality design team Turnbridge brought to the project, some of whom you heard at Public Speaks Out. However, after the public hearing, staff identified over 60 questions and concerns that council had regarding the proposal, and the developer has listened. Many of their responses to your questions come in the form of offered conditions and changes to the PDP. Katie will review each of those additional conditions in a moment, but before she does, I'd like to highlight a few of them. Turnbridge has added a new section to in, the, in the design guidebook, committing to an enhanced appearance on Walnut Street, a special treatment along the Walnut Street entrance, and increased bike and pedestrian activity. There's been a commitment to provide a minimum of 1,100 trees and at least 10 acres of green space in streetscapes and in the berm between the site and Ivy Lane. In addition, Turnbridge has committed to enhance the berm to our type A standard and provide two acres of community gathering area. There's a commitment to reduce over seven acres of impervious area from the watershed via, via removal and implementation of low impact design practices. And you'll hear Matt Flynn provide more information on this topic. The applicant is also committed to maintaining local transit through the site and the project will create another regional transit opportunity and be a potential stop for future bus rapid transit. So council, you have seen infill opportunities in the past at the mall. This proposal is holistic in nature with a developer that's seeking to not just repurpose, but rethink the site. And like any smart director, I'll now turn it over to employee of the year, Katie Dry. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening again, Council. We are excited to bring to you tonight the Cary Town Center rezoning. This request is to rezone the property from general commercial conditional use and mixed-use district to the mixed-use district. The rezoning will, will redevelop the entire mall site, which is 87 acres. It's currently built with 1 million square feet of commercial building space and almost 2 million square feet in parking and circulation area. Um, and this is almost 5,000 service parking spaces. The redevelopment will turn this into a mixed-use site with a range of uses and building heights. The rezoning has a preliminary development plan. It seeks to build a new street grid. It will create 18 development blocks. And although a mix of uses are allowed on each block, the plan identifies primary uses for each. Blocks one through four will be office. Five through six will be commercial. This will be the urban core of the site. Blocks 7 through 14 could be office or residential. And as we transition towards the eastern part of the site, blocks 15 through 18 will be residentially focused. We note that government uses could be allowed in any of these blocks. The site commits to achieving the density of the Imagine Carry Community Plan through framing the perimeter streets with buildings of at least three floors. The western half of the site may go up to 12 floors. And as we transition towards the eastern portion of the site, uh, they'll range between three to six floors. The urban core, which is in the center of the site, will hold retail and dining options and will allow for lower building heights of one floor, but could still go up to six floors. The development program has minimum and maximum land use allotments, which would enable up to 1.2 million square feet of office, 360,000 square feet of commercial, 450 hotel rooms, 
1,800 residential units. The residential would consist of multifamily and townhouses, and there would be a maximum of 175 townhouses allowed on the site. I'd like to briefly review the process um, to date for Cary Town Center and then speak to the changes uh, since the council was last seen in this case in August of this year. The rezoning <coughs> application was filed with the town in April of 2019. Neighborhood meetings were held in June and August, followed by the town council public hearing and work session in August. The Planning and Zoning Board had a work session and found the case to be consistent with the Imagine Carry plan by a vote of eight to zero in November. And during this time period, the preliminary development plan has also been through four rounds of review with staff and has evolved to address comments from council, staff, and the public. At the council work session in August, council comments were grouped into five categories, including appearance, environmental, internal and external mobility, and project demographics. I will share with you the changes to the application since the public hearing in the work session, and everything that I'm sharing with you tonight has been committed to through a zoning condition. And a full list of the conditions are included in the staff report and the preliminary development plan. The first category is appearance. This includes things such as a design guidebook and the Walnut Street streetscape. The design guidebook has been revised to uh, cover um, guidance and provide architectural guidance for office, commercial, and residential buildings. The design guidebook also contains guidance for internal and external streetscapes, signage, and community gathering spaces. Of particular importance to Council was a look and the feel of the Walnut Street streetscape. And since the public hearing and the work session, the applicant has increased the streetscape from 10 feet to 30 feet, and they've increased the sidewalk to a 10-foot streetside trail. And to illustrate the look and feel of the streetscape, the applicant has included a page in the design guidebook. This is a copy of that page. We move on to the next topic, and that was environmental. Environmental considerations included topics such as the streetscapes, tree plantings, and the buffer next to Ivy <coughs> Mountain, as well as stormwater. Since the Town Council public hearing and the work session, the applicant has increased the width of the Walnut Street streetscape from 10 feet to 30 feet. Maintaining and enhancing the existing buffer next to Ivy Meadows was also of great importance to Council and residents in the adjacent neighborhood. Since the submittal of the application, the applicant has proposed to maintain the buffer next to Ivy Meadows, but since the council work session, they've increased this commitment by um, committing to a type A planting standard, which is Cary's highest standard for buffers and screening. Also, when we look at the perimeter streetscape along Walnut, Manor, and Carytown Boulevard, um, this will account for approximately, as well as the, the buffer next to Ivy Meadows, this will account for about 7% of the site, which is about six and a half acres, which will be vegetated. The redevelopment also presents an opportunity to improve the tree canopy on the site. The applicant has committed to 1,100 new trees that will be planted. This, these trees will be located within the streetscapes along internal and perimeter roads, as well as within the community gathering areas. And due to the urban nature of this development, the PDP establishes that a variation in character and the species of the traditional canopy would be allowed. Uh, the design guidebook also covers planting and soil criteria for the trees within the site. The next item is stormwater, and I'd like to ask Matt Flynn, stormwater development manager, to share with you the stormwater commitments for the site. Thank you, Katie. Uh, good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council. Uh, so over the past few months, the developers of Cary Town Center have been collaborating with a number of regional stormwater experts. Uh, that includes members of our downtown stormwater working group, our environmental advisory board, faculty at NC State, and staff at the town of Cary, as well as the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality. The result is a zoning condition in which over seven acres or over 300,000 square feet of impervious surface will be removed from the Walnut Creek watershed. This is really kind of a special situation insofar as every time I'm up here talking to you, there's an increase in impervious and a need to mitigate that additional runoff. We have the opposite hand, uh, going on here. So as a result, we have a guarantee of a reduction in volume and a guarantee in a reduction in peak flow discharge for all events. 
So with that, whether it be the 10, 50, 500, all of them will be reduced. So the engineering hasn't been done yet, but a good educated guess from me at this point would be a seven to 10% decrease across the board. In addition with that volume reduction, it's kind of a gold standard because we're going beyond mitigation here and providing restoration. I do know that um, Dr. Hunt at NC State is working with the Department of Environmental Quality to, uh, and the developers to install monitoring devices so NC State can track what they anticipate will be improvements to the health of the watershed surrounding this redevelopment. So from my perspective, this is really good stuff. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to uh, Katie and I'll answer any questions at the end. And happy holidays to each of you. Thank you. He's great. <laughs> <laughs> Next year's employee of the year, right? <laughs> He's got a chance. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the next category. That is internal mobility. This refers to travel within the site, in particular for uh, pedestrians, bicyclists, and transit users. Street side trails have been added to all perimeter roads, and they will also be built along the eastern property line just west of the buffer next to Ivy Meadows. Additionally, bicycle accommodations, including separated bike lanes, are included along specific street corridors, providing safe and comfortable connectivity internal to the site. Along with the improvements to the Walnut Street streetscape previously mentioned, the applicants have committed to enhancing the southern entrance from Walnut Street into the site, with a 20-foot streetscape and a 10-foot planted median up until the first entrance, or the first intersection within the site. The fourth category is off-site mobility. This refers to uh, the degree to which the site integrates and connects to surrounding sites in the area. This site co contemplates pedestrian travel to and from Cary High School. The applicant and staff have worked together to explore options for safer and more convenient travel. Um, and at staff's recommendation, the applicant has committed to providing a pedestrian crossing at Southeast Maynard Road and installing a pedestrian hybrid beacon. The town has a project to install a pedestrian hybrid beacon across Walnut Street in 2020, and the pedestrian <coughs> route through the Village Square Shopping Center is already built. Through coordination with town staff, the applicants have identified the preferred corridor for future go carry transit through the site, and they've committed to coordination with the town for transit stop locations during development plan. As noted before, Cary Town Boulevard is along one of the future BRT routes uh, between Raleigh and Cary, and that could lead to additional transit opportunities. The applicants have also added an alternative standard from the LDO seeking relief from the requirement to provide cross access to the gas station parcel at the intersection of Walnut and Maynard. The applicant has indicated that cross access would severely impact their design options and to ensure an urban form for the site, the applicant has proposed a zoning condition that 90% of the parking within block 12 would be, would be located within parking decks. This takes us to our last category, which is project demographics. This refers to the land use makeup uh, for the site, the densities, um, some of the phasing as well. So some of the changes since the council public hearing and work session is the applicants have established an urban core within the center of the site, and this corresponds to um, design guidance found in the design guidebook. They have limited the amount of townhouses to a maximum of 175. They further clarify the phasing. They've limited the number of drive-through uses associated this to, with the site to three and established that no drive-through uses would be allowed with a restaurant. And they've also further clarified their parking. Um, they've, since the work session, they've removed a request for relief from visitor parking for residential uses. So this concludes the review of the changes to the rezoning since the council hearing and work session in August. Next, we will review the rezoning with the Imagine Carry plan. First, we note the site's within a destination center, and it's within the Eastern Carry Gateway Special Planning Area, which will be a, de a destination and gateway forming the entrance to Carry from Raleigh and other cities to the east. The plan envisions Eastern Carry Gateway to be a high-density destination center. It will foster business through high-quality design and connected mix of uses. 
Our review finds that the project furthers three of the overall policies which apply to the entire Eastern Cary Gateway. This includes fostering mixed-use developments, improving the visual experience of gateway corridors, and in this case, that would be Cary Town Boulevard, and focusing on connectivity within and between developments. Within the Eastern Cary Gateway, the Cary Town Center site is identified as a mixed-use center, commercial-based. The plan gives specific guidance for the site, and we note that several of the policies apply to what's being proposed. So when we look at the guidance found in the Eastern Cary Gateway Special Planning Area for the site, the plan notes that the site is ripe for redevelopment, and this plan proposes a complete redevelopment of the site. We also note the plan calls that the use should be compact and have a vibrant form, and we believe the plan does that through the street grid and the development blocks that will be created. The plan also states that uh, the existing mall with large parking lots provides a redevelopment opportunity to create small blocks, mixed uses, and public spaces, and that there should be context-sensitive transitions to the adjacent neighborhood. Finally, the plan states that development should have a mix of uses, which this plan does. So staff's finding is that the rezoning is consistent with the overall guidance of the Imagine Carry Community Plan. We find that the proposal supports policies from the live, work, shop, shape, and move chapters. And we also find that the, pol the proposal furthers guidance found in the Eastern Carry Gateway Special Planning Area. <coughs> And now, Council, I'd like to ask Ryan E. the Planning and Zoning Board Chair, to share with you their review and recommendation. And following the Chair's summary, I will conclude staff's presentation. Thanks, Katie. Good evening, Mayor, members of Council. Uh, overall, the Board felt that this rezoning request <coughs> fit very well, and several components, including walkability, modernized and innovative feel, and the large amounts of community gathering space really jumped out as positives. Uh, we recognize that the area is in need of redevelopment, and we focused most of our discussion and deliberations around those areas of the comprehensive plan that really focused on that. Uh, some of the specific feedback included uh, one member commented on the lack of retail being proposed as part of this uh, compared to what the plan recommends. A few of the other members uh, felt that it was potentially a good location to offer affordable housing and commented on the lack of traffic mitigations around the two major intersections that are adjacent to the site. Uh, and overall, the board recognized that the request doesn't necessarily check all the boxes, but when we look at it holistically, uh, it really is a good fit, and it follows the guidance provided in the Eastern Cary Gateway and the overall comprehensive plan. Questions? Thank you. So Council, in summary, and based on the Planning and Zoning Board's unanimous recommendation for consistency with the Imagine Carry Plan staff, and staff's review, staff is excited to recommend that Council vote for approval for this rezoning tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dry. I think it's important to say right off the bat that this wasn't easy, especially for staff and for the applicant. Uh, even after it had been going on a few months, I remember the work session and the applicants stood up there, there were like two of them, and we were just peppering them nonstop. And um, we finally had to stop because we had to move on to other items. It was at a quarterly meeting. And so they took the time to address all those, and even that wasn't enough, N not for me. And so I asked them in and had them all come in and address my issues with as, as far as aesthetics on Walnut and traffic, which were my biggest concerns. I had a lot of concerns. And they did that. They addressed all of that. I think in some communities, uh, with a dead mall, uh, the interest right up front will be, I'll take anything. And that wasn't the approach here. Uh, this council, like, yeah, we want to redevelop the mall, but we're going to do it right. And that's the carry way. And we've always done it that way. So I thank Ms. Dry, everyone involved for getting us to this point, And I'm definitely going to support this thank the applicants for all the time and effort that they put in to get us to this point. And I'll open it up to my colleagues at this time. Oh, yes. my comments. Uh, I feel like we just um, missed getting hit by a bus because before this, we had, originally we had a proposal for a large golf facility, mm -hmm. which I think would have been terrible, a terrible neighbor for Ivy Lane. And then 
we thought, okay, well, we got it better. We got a, a gigantic box. Big box. A big box. And not only that, it was going to be a big box that had statewide draw, so the people who came in and out would be coming in for a day trip and leaving. They weren't people who were putting down roots here in Cary. It was going to be a lot of surface parking. And if you remember, there were buffer reductions on that. I mean, they barely wanted to screen that gigantic box at all. And so I feel like we missed getting hit by a bus. I mean, this is so phenomenally better than those two original proposals. This creates a place that people will want to live and work. It'll give you, um, give our citizens an opportunity to have a place that means something to them and it will improve the whole area. This is, this is the type of solution that will enhance the residents on Ivy Lane and people will be glad to live near it next to it. Um, I do want to thank Turnbridge and Sasaki and McAdams and the legal folks, Jamie. You guys really worked so hard. And when you first came to us, you came with such a spirit of wanting to work together, of collaboration, and that just went through the whole process. I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled that this is coming to what my daughter, when she was about five years old, referred to as the dying mall. So this is going to be such a vast improvement, and it's going to be so good for our entire area. So I'm thrilled. Thank you. Other comments? Yeah. In my district, I like yeah, it. Yeah. Uh, uh, since since all of you was, uh, were reminding me how old I was earlier, uh, <laughs> I just wanted to let you know that just to the south of that, um, which is now the Barnes & Noble, you know, for the record, that was my first no vote. And oh. it was a no vote because it didn't address stormwater. I mean, I was the new beyond, and I was kind of ticked about our lack of attention to stormwater. And <coughs> the way the stormwater goes here goes behind the Piney Plains. Excuse me, uh, Pirate's Cove, mm -hmm. my apologies. And, and they've always had these chronic problems. So over the years, we had to pick up the cost to fix the stormwater problem behind Barnes & Noble. And now... You know, good things come to those who wait. And so here it is, like 30 years later, and we really have this holistic plan. And, you know, I, we've, we've gotten a lot of emails from folks about concerns. And, um, and I guess if you have your blinders on and you're down at 10 foot above the ground and you're just looking at one thing, you know, it's like you can look at different pieces and they might look ugly, but when you step back and you put them all together, they kind of kind of look neat and they look good. I think, uh, uh, I also want to, you know, share my uh, uh, congratulations or compliments um, to the developer for taking the time to treat each and every one of those emails um, um, with full consideration and, uh, and worked on the issues. And most of them were around stormwater and trees. And, um, you know, maybe to to some, we, we, we've not reached the perfect product, but um, it's hard to imagine expecting and demanding more than this uh, and what we're going to get. So I, I just say, uh, you know, thank you for working with us. And I, uh, as you said earlier about uh, and the other, uh, on the other uh, project about Ivy Ellington, that we stay with it and focus, I believe the opportunity is here to work with a good partner that as we see and we learn better ways to improve those trees or those canopies or that environment, it's going to happen. And uh, uh, I'm just so finally glad to see this area uh, coming back around. And just think, it's all part of the Eastern Gateway and it's all part of Fenton, just north of it. The two largest developments in our history are happening right now. Exactly. It's kind of it's neat. And, and the fact that we're able to drive that to a high quality and we're working with good, uh, good partners to make that happen. I think this is an exciting day. Other comments? Well, I'd like, like to add my thanks to the applicant and to the staff for making so many positive changes since the last time we saw this. It's great. I just have comments or questions in two areas. Uh, one is trees. Uh, we've, I hope I got the numbers right, 1,100 canopy trees, as Mr. Zumwalt had, had indicated before, of a certain diameter that would cover 22% of the site. To me, that sounds fantastic. Those numbers sound great. But yet we've heard from some citizens, both in email and conversations that I've had, 
citizens who are experts when it comes to trees, people who I've trusted for years when it comes to trees, are not 100% happy with what's been provided. And I just want to make sure, I don't think it's time to settle all that right here at the table, but I do want to make sure that as this process moves forward, <coughs> even if we approve this tonight, that the applicant or staff could work with these citizens to come to a better understanding of what we have. Um, the numbers presented by Mr. Zumwalt sound a lot better than what we have right now on the, on the mall property. But I, I want to make sure that these citizens are, their concerns are satisfied. Secondly, uh, simultaneous to this plan going through the works and separate from it as it should be, there's been some activity about locating a community center or recreation center on the site somewhere. I just want to make sure that by approving this tonight, we are not precluding that, that somehow it would still be allowed as time moves on. There are a lot of pieces have to fall in place before that happens. It's not going to happen tomorrow. But I want to make sure that we're not precluding that possibility by approving what we're doing tonight. Yes, I believe that use would be um, considered a government use, and government uses would be allowed in any of the development blocks associated with the plan. Okay, thank you. Other questions, comments? I just have, I want to thank, add my thanks as well, um, but this time to um, Mr. Flynn for um, giving us an insight into stormwater management that is so very different from everything we've been talking about. Everything we've been talking about is mitigation. This is the first time that we're actually going to the source and removing impervious surface. And so um, thank you for uh, uh, being very clear and descriptive about how this is different. Because when I went back and looked at the original Carytown Center plan, I believe it was a 10 year, it had to mitigate a 10 year storm. And now we're all, we're already better than the way it is with this new plan. So thank you for um, sharing that information with us. Other comments? Yeah, I would like to uh, acknowledge all the hard work that Ms. Kenjord has done together with the council and the applicants for making this happen. I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to uh, make an important vote um, on this night, the first night. Um, and, and I want to um, emphasize that uh, the mall, the, the, the town center is just not an average mall. Uh, many citizens who have lived in Cary for a long time are very attached to the mall. And uh, exciting things that you will um, transform the mall are really important to them. And my kids have played in the mall in the play area many times and we've shopped there and we have grown very much attached to the mall. So it's not just an average place, it's a, it's a a place that we want to feel proud of, and it's an integral part of uh, Cary community. Um, so while you develop this project, I want to, you to keep in mind that how special this place is, and I want to thank you for your efforts to make this happen. And we can, Cary can really set an example how a good redevelopment of a dying mall can be done, and we can set an example uh, for our country. And as you know, online retailers like Amazon is taking over, you know, the mall in many places in the country, and we can, it's such a wonderful opportunity to set an example, and I'm thrilled uh, to be voting for this uh, very exciting project. Thank you. No? It's all been said. It's good okay. stuff. Okay. <laughs> How about a motion? <laughs> it's good. Oh, I'll make a motion. All right. It's your district. Go for it. Yeah. If you'll use the motion at your table. Oh, come on. I, mean, I can read this. Oh, come on. <laughs> Hang on. I move that we approve <laughs> statement of consistency as attached to this motion document to 19 RZ11, Cary Town Center PDB, and rezoning 19 REZ11, Cary Town Center PDB. Second. There's a, there's a motion and a second. Discussion. All in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thanks once again to all that's involved. <coughs> Looking forward to seeing things happen. <laughs> we move to our second discussion item. It's a council direction regarding researching the development of a transportation mobility advisory board. And this is uh, <coughs> Mrs. Bush, but I think it says Mr. Stiegel first. Excuse me, I'm losing my voice here. <coughs> uh, yes, uh, so, uh, oh, I, 
over the past several months in particular, and I know this has um, you know, been a concept that, that uh, Councilman Bush has held near and dear to our heart for some time, is how could um, we better involve and more effectively involve our citizens in our transportation and mobility um, kind of efforts at the town of Cary, which there's been some talk about this evening. And in, in other communities, having uh, what they usually call a transportation commission or board is, is really common. And I think one reason why Cary's had, or the reason why Cary's had so much success in this area in the past without one is because of people like those gentlemen sitting right there. And uh, Cary, when I came uh, three years ago, I was, went up to what I found out was the real-time traffic center and said, what's, you know, why, what are those people doing there watching TV? Um, <laughs> so they're not watching TV, Sean. <laughs> they're monitoring traffic. Traffic. I'm like, they're doing what? And he said, they're they're monitoring traffic in real time. I said, communities of this size don't have that capability. I'm like, well, we do in Cary, and we always have. We have fiber to every intersection, and so Cary, and we have an in-house team of experts, which most municipalities, again, except for the largest ones, they outsource all traffic engineering. Um, and Jerry, and through David Spencer, who is a traffic expert, maybe not so much in picking out shirts, but he is a traffic expert, um, <laughs> is, is somebody that we can Ooh. call upon, sorry, David, Ken, uh, for this level of expertise. And so finding a way um, to, to bring our citizens involved, get our citizens involved in a way they can help us advance this would be a little bit different in Cary because of that in-house expertise that we have. And so I think uh, through conversations that, that I've had with Lori, if you think of our stormwater group, where we've had stormwater experts for quite some time, um, but trying to find a way to do it a little bit differently in a way, in the most different way, was involving our citizens, our citizen experts in that process. And so even though this is an area that is highly regulated, um, a lot of it isn't subject to um, you know, kind of the opinions and policy decisions that might be made by a manager or a member of our community or even a council, there is room to get involved in helping our citizens and our experts think through some of these major decisions uh, <coughs> regarding regional connections, um, helping people understand and communicate our projects and priorities back. Certainly an area that uh, Lori's passionate about is uh, the, uh, the intersection, no pun intended, between cyclists and vehicles. And so what we're asking for this, this evening is not a decision yet because the council is very uh, wise and careful in the use of its resources, including staff, is to give you options on how something like this could be designed and then how it could add value now and potentially in the future. And so maybe that's for a short amount of time and then there's a certain charter in the short term and maybe a different one over a longer period of time. Last thing I'll say is I'm so appreciative to Jerry and David and the rest of the team because look every other place I work I don't care what they say publicly the last thing they want are citizen involvement through boards and commissions <laughs> that's that they, they'll tell you it's a good thing on the record they don't like it because they feel that it's a level of competition it slows things down it's a pain they have a different version of that story and I could tell you I know that personally because I was one of those people until I came to carry but in Cary, our citizens help us make decisions. And in Cary, our staff is so competent, they don't feel threatened by it. They feel enhanced by it. And that's a real sign of a true professional, where they see more opinions coming in as a way to enhance that. And so when I mentioned this to Jerry, I said, uh, I, I think this is something that we need to do. Jerry said, you know, that sounds good. I think we can benefit from it. And in the way Jerry says, he said, I, I got you. <laughs> and so we're here asking for the ability to be specific about how it could work and they'll let um, you provide us a pathway and a process by which we would go forward. Very good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Bush, you wanna add anything? Um, yeah, so when we first started the Cary Community Plan, or Imagine Cary, we would often hear from our citizens that they wanted to live in communities that were walkable, right? That they could jump, um, their, jump on a sidewalk or jump on their bike and get to some place rather quickly. Go to a restaurant, go grocery shopping, um, go see a friend. I mean, from where I, have a house in Preston Village, I was gonna say where I live. But where I have a house in Preston Village, I have what's called a walk score of zero, which basically says I can't walk anywhere from there to get to places. 
And what we heard along the way with the CARE Community Plan was that people wanted, many people wanted to live in, in multi-use communities where they could live, work, play, learn, recreate, and get there in a multitude of mobility options. Um, I mean, even the CDC has a website about walkable communities and what they give to a community from a health benefit, et cetera. And I also noticed over the past year, specifically this last year, um, we've all received an increase in emails from many citizens uh, letting us know that things are getting tougher out there as a pedestrian or as a cyclist. We've had some um, horrific accidents, whether they're cyclists, uh, whether they're you know kids crossing the street and um, you know problems there, there's lots of reasons for it. Whether it's distracted drivers, whether it's um, people that aren't doing the right thing, there are lots of opportunities for us to to do better. Um, just this evening, we had four people during public speaks out or a hearing all talk about pedestrian safety, basically about being scared, even here in downtown. Um, and so there's some opportunities, I believe, to address some of that problem. But there's also some really cool things that are, that are on the way. We've got a cycle track pilot that's coming up. We have the bond referendum talks about um, access over Highway 55 and what that pedestrian access would look like. We've got new pedestrian and cycle tracks that <coughs> now we know that it's been voted on at the Carytown Center property. So there's some op, there's not only what we can do to improve things, but there's also how are we going to, what is the process by which we're gonna make mobility even better in the future with some of these options? And the idea then here is multifold once take, staff takes a look at it. It would allow us to take an adaptive look at what we're doing, similar to the way we did with stormwater. Um, tap, tapping into the intellectual capital of our citizens, being really clear about what we want to accomplish, and letting our, and most importantly, as well, letting our citizens know, as as Matt Flynn or or maybe it was Jerry Jensen or David Spencer, we got this. We hear we hear you. We want to do something about it. Maybe it's an education campaign. Maybe it's more science. I don't know what it is, but let's tap into the folks who really know, which absolutely. Um, involves our staff and also let our citizens know that this is important to us and we want to make it happen. Thank you. Um, my comments would be I believe we have, I really believe we have the best staff that can be. I mean, you guys are amazing. And I also believe we have the best citizenry. And you combine those two together and I think wonderful things can happen. So I'm anxious to see how this will play out and what recommendations will be made. However, I'm going to need details. Sure. How do you get from putting that together and getting something real out of it is, is what I'm looking for. But yeah, I'm excited uh, to put people together. The stormwater is what I think of. The, mm -hmm. the committee you created, even though that was a task force, um, the, what came out of that group was pretty amazing. And I can see that happening. Mm -hmm. uh, with this as well so yeah I think that's a good idea yeah I think that um, you know like with stormwater and that um, you know it, it uh, you're dealing with kind of a, a different set of problems uh, I think the challenge on this one and uh, it's I'm, I'm kind of arguing in support but the challenge of this one is uh, listening to those same people tonight I, I think every one of them said and we had great uh, uh, traffic improvements there. I mean, we have the wonderful signage. We have the wonderful, you know, the, the question is, how do we deal with distracted and stupid drivers? I mean, what do we do? It, it, it's a, I think it's a serious problem. So I think as we're looking and we're looking at best practices and what other communities are doing, I think everybody's trying to figure out a way. We just keep investing in more and more uh, of the islands, the cones, the safeties. Um, you know, I know I walk across like Piney Plains in, in mine, and it's it's a it's a stretch, and uh, you deal with almost every day. The security is there, the design is there, but you can't stop the bad behavior. I'm just I don't, I'm I'm frustrated by that, and, I, and that's what I hear from the citizens coming up, and I don't want to get false expectations that we can spend millions to try to, you know fix one bad driver, but 
I do think the opportunity is the more eyes on it, the more dialogue there is, we can maybe learn some lessons to to deal with it. But you know, as a walker, I I hear their that plea, and I'm just frustrated at when I see all the good things we're doing and they're just ignored. I don't know how you deal with that, but I'm looking forward to putting those collective minds together and figuring it out. Other comments? If not, I would entertain a motion. Or do we need a motion? Do you need a motion or? Just yeah, a motion direction. to direct staff to investigate. Yeah. Motion to direct staff. Um, as moved. Okay. Is there <laughs> second. a second? Second discussion. Yeah. Um, just a couple of things that I'm going to want to know when this comes back is, you know, seems to be a lot of talk about what this board or commission could do or could talk about it. I'm going to need a little more certainty than that. Okay. Yeah. What's what's the, the primary goal? What's the focus? What are they actually going to be doing? Um, because as you said, we've already got the best transportation department in the state. So what value do they add? Um, I'm going to know, I'm going to want to know what the makeup of these citizen appointees might be. I don't want just, I don't want to say average citizens because not carry citizens aren't average but if we're going to do something like this I don't want to see experts so I want to see people that have experience in this not just the loudest person in the neighborhood so we're going to put them on a committee so they maybe don't be as loud um, so I, I'm really going to want and then I'm going to want to know what the impact is on staff time you know what are, what are the resources is this a once a month thing is this a, a forever thing is this a temporary task force like stormwater and, and that so um, I'm going to need to know more before I can support this um, and, and primarily, you know, the, the, the makeup and, and what, what exact problem are we trying to solve? I agree, more eyes the better. Um, but, you know, like Grandma says, sometimes you can have too many cooks in the kitchen. I think we're what we're doing is we're asking staff to... I, I get that, I get that. And I do and I'm just like to... the fact that you're giving that clarity, because I think that's important. Uh, a lot of times when we've done these things, we've done this in the environment and other areas, uh, you know, people come with their set of uh, uh, complaints. They're not adding anything to learn. So, you know, I think this is going to be a give and take, and I think the critical, unfortunately, the challenge for, for the town manager and the staff is to kind of come up with what is this beast going to look like and what's the value add it's going to be. Well, well, the other thing I want to add is I would love to see if we do something like this, that the board or commission members or task force members, whatever it ends up being, are picked by staff, similar to what we do with zoning board of adjustment. Um, or make, stormwater. Makes it an apolitical process, and we're, we're truly picking the right people for the job. Yeah. Well, I, I, I like the fact that we would, I like the idea, so when you guys start thinking about ideas, of patterning it after what we do with stormwater, because mm -hmm. you had these experts that brought it, that came in. What is important to me, and I've already talked about this with Sean, is that we have a body of work for this group to do. I don't want to bring people <coughs> in and then not have any action item. What distinguished the stormwater initiative <coughs> is that we had a problem to be resolved and they went at it. We do have an excellent transportation network. We are far more advanced than most communities in the United States just by having fiber optic run to all of our signal, you know, all of our intersections alone. That itself is fantastic. But there are things on the horizon like using artificial intelligence, computer vision to be able to better manage your intersections and so forth. So there's a lot of opportunities on the horizon. I just want to make sure that if we form this committee, there's something for this committee to do. A couple things I'll add that'll be probably different in the past. It'll be important here, and we'll, uh, we'll spell this out, is we'll be specific on what they won't do. Because again, since this area is heavily, lots of it, it's heavily, heavily regulated, we would want everybody to know from going forward that this is an area that certainly is traffic related, that um, it wouldn't be appropriate and most of the time lawful or responsible to have anyone but the paid experts being involved in that. So we'll spell that part out. And I, I think we actually, we, we do have a, a, a problem to solve in that, and again, you saw some of it here tonight, is traffic is one of those things where everybody has an opinion about it, and not a single person has an opinion that it's getting better, mm -hmm. okay? But the facts are often very different than that. And again, there is a lot of science that goes behind that, like you know, stop signs can't just be put up to slow down traffic. 
many citizens articulate the wants and the needs that they have on to do certain things. And so what I see this is, is allowing our citizens who are on it that maybe aren't an expert in traffic, but they're an expert in adaptive issues and in, in neighborhood engagement to allow our citizens to have an, a better understanding. And then they will in turn educate their neighbors, which is often the most effective way of doing it. So I see this as a way of increasing the level of competency and understanding. It's not gonna, it's not gonna make complaints about traffic going away. I mean, I complain about traffic, <laughs> right? Um, but I think it's that touch point. And I was uh, driving home uh, and I was on 54, um, going home, new traffic pattern because I moved, and it took me about 45 minutes to get home. Now, most of that was going through Morrisville. I um, <laughs> just want to say that. But when I got home, I said, you know, it, I said to my wife, it took me 45 minutes to get home. She's like, yeah, and I go, that, remind, that makes me feel like I live in Illinois again. I don't want to live in Illinois again. Right. I, and that, to me, I really connected with it because that feeling, that fear that our citizens have, that Carrie's not going to stay Carrie, Mm -hmm. is what they're talking about when I, I believe when they articulate traffic. It's not so much about the traffic, it's I don't want to lose this amazing thing that I have to be able to lo live and carry. And we need to reassure them that they're not going to lose it. For instance, there's a plan for 54 that cost <laughs> that, or emerging plans for 54 that cost that. So I think there's a lot of great work to do in this area and they'll, and they'll see it and feel it from our experts and we will uh, be so detailed It'll take us a couple of months to put this together. Um, it'll be a collaboration by our traffic folks, but we're going to get people involved like Carrie, who's not a traffic expert, but it's an expert in a lot of things. Carrie's like, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> she did, yeah, she just found out just what? now in real time. <laughs> and, and that's how we, we make really good decisions is she'll be able to um, really model kind of what these, the non-traffic experts voice will be in that area. And we'll put together some great recommendations for you to consider. And so we're excited about this opportunity. Great. Any other comments? Yeah, Kerry <coughs> is experiencing tremendous growth and, you know, our citizens have the t two top concerns probably are um, growth and environment. I think this is a tremendous opportunity to um, address the transportation issues and you know address the mobility issue to create a board where citizens can get involved and provide input and you know I talked to citizens they were like you know we want more safer bike lanes we want to take advantage of the opportunity now downtown is developing and you know how how can we be connected from our neighborhood to downtown and if we have safer bike lanes that you know, take people from their neighborhood to these destination centers, to to downtown. And, you know, in the next several decades, and we will see the transportation will be becoming a priority as our population grows. I mean, that's just inevitable that comes with it. And we are embracing the development and growth um, that Kerry is currently experiencing, but we need to address and be on top of the game and, you know, address these traffic issues and, um, and work on these issues before they become as really headache. So, um, you know, I think it's really important to create, a, you know, an opportunity for the citizens to be involved in the process. Any other comments? We have a motion on the table. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Before we adjourn, um, Ms. Bush graciously gave up her opening remarks, uh, and she would like to take <coughs> us into the holiday season since this is our last meeting of the year. And she has I'm not singing. Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> you made it like take us in. Yeah, take us into the holiday season with some closing remarks. Well, I'll, I'll make this short because I know that we're all tired. It's been a long meeting with um, a lot of magic, a lot of heartfelt commentary, um, and a lot of great work that's been done. And let's be honest, it is the last regular council meeting of the year. So I thought I'd take a moment uh, and just thank all of our town staff from the people that we see every time we're here, to all the people who are behind you who we don't get to see, to all of the folks who keep us safe, who keep carry the kind of community that it is, that keep our water clean and our sewers moving, 
um, our roads uh, clean and maintain um, and just keep us working day to day. We're really grateful to you. Uh, you don't, you make us look good. Th this is probably, like, seeing, seeing some of the jobs that you all do, um, we've got it a lot easier. So thank you for everything that you do. Um, I also want to take a moment to thank all of our citizens. You keep us on our toes as well. Um, you have thoughtful insights and tough criticism when we need it and patience most of the time um, and making Carrie the best place to be. And so for all of us in Carrie from all backgrounds and beliefs, uh, religions or not practicing, um, I hope that this holiday season reminds us all of the spirit of brotherhood that we have here um, and the generosity that we all have as citizens. And I thank you all and I hope you have a great holiday season and happy new year. Thank you. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So so There's a motion, a second, third. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you. of Cary TV. Visit the Town of Cary's website at townofcary.org.